The Two Mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. Good afternoon, you're listening to The Two Mics right here on Talk Radio. We've got a cornucopia of entertainment for you today, kicking off with our take on the Kennedy Papers. What exactly have we learned? What exactly have they kept out of the public uh, domain? And why are they being released now? We're finding out why the rich are getting richer. We're analysing Porky's receipt from the bookshop he claimed he visited the other day. We're talking movies with Brian Viner after I was ripped off by going to see Thor with my children at half term. And we're getting a guide to drinking around the world, as if we need one, uh, with Neil Ridley. You can get in touch on 0344. 499-1000. There's also a Porky quiz, of course. We're going to be getting out the box of Trivial Pursuits. I'm predicting Porky will make no more than four out of ten. You're listening to the Two Mics on Talk Radio. Talk Radio, we are the two mics, and of course, we've got loads to get on. It's a beautiful day here in London. It's sunny, it's crisp. Uh, we've got receipts to examine one from Porky. I've got one from the movies that I went to last night uh, to see the new Thor movie, uh, which everybody's been raving about. Mm. Unfortunately for me, uh, I've got the receipt here, and it cost me £35.50. For one adult and two children. Isn't that's, that extraordinary? That's not expensive, is it? What do you mean it's not expensive? It's thir- 11 50 for a teenager, yeah. 10 25 for a child, yeah. and 13 75 for an adult. I don't think that's expensive. I'm sorry, for, for less than two, two hours of entertainment. Two hours of entertainment. No. I mean, you know, I went to two hours of entertainment the other night. It cost me 375 quid. Well, you call Chelsea uh, versus Everton. You call that entertainment. Well, of course it was entertainment. Uh, My muck. Everton team were there. You're a mug. Um, but listen, stop whinging because, I mean, it's a family thing. You're always going on about, you know, your, your fatherly duties and yes. all that. Then you take your your kids out now yeah. you, you put them on a guilt trip no because your children will be listening to this and on a guilt trip because mm. you know, daddy's moaning about how much it costs to go to the oh, cinema don't worry i took him out for dinner the other night that was yeah. 100 quid yeah well uh, another moan oh, yeah daddy's moaning about paying well, for you know, dinner they're very privileged our yeah. children yeah. these days i think they should know it yeah now before well, you we should get feel to, uh, privileged being a father i do feel very sort privileged of whinging about taking your children I out feel, and costing you a few bob i feel very i mean a very few bob i feel very privileged indeed how much did the last bottle of champagne cost that you bought uh it cost five pounds no, 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 no. I, I mean I the bought, proper champagne. I bought a half bottle of champagne no. in Waitrose, and they had a special offer. It was a five. Okay. Well, I've been on. I've been in places with you where you bought champagne for seventy-five quid for a bottle. That's a bottle. Not of bottle unusual. Usually. Yeah, not unusual. Is I it? haven't bought one of those for many, no, many months. No, you're moaning. You're moaning for mm. spending half that amount yeah. taking your two sons and yeah. yourself to the cinema. Well, the champagne. You are a disgrace. The champagne is for entertaining you me are a and other people. You know, I had to sit through this. Yeah, uh, usually this some awful floozy. Movie. Anyway, listen. Mm. Uh, that's not a very nice thing to say if you're talking about my children listening. So kindly cease and desist. No, not at all. Thank you very much Not indeed. at all. I'm talking about, you know, the sort of people you have to mix with socially to get business really? done. Yeah. I see. All right. Now, John Newman is an author and political science professor yep. at James Madison University in Virginia. Uh, here's the man we're about to speak to now because uh, we're going to ask him why yes. uh, they've redacted some of the files in the Kennedy Papers, why Donald Trump has decided to release them now, and what, if anything, is still hidden away uh, in the vaults. Yep. John, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome. No, good morning over here. Good yeah, morning, indeed. John. Now, it's morning in America, as Ronald Reagan used to say. What does it all mean? Because these papers don't particularly reveal very much about anything that we didn't know. However, we're interested in what we have not seen in terms of what has been held back. What can you tell us about that? Okay, at the top of my list on what's not in there would be David Attlee Phillips and Bill, uh, William Harvey. And who are they? Well, David Attlee Phillips was the CIA super sleuth uh, Guy for propaganda and psychological warfare. Okay. Bill Harvey was head of the Cuban operations uh, section called Task Force W and was involved intimately in plots to kill Castro and use the mob. He was very close to Johnny Roselli. Um, and he's one of the people uh, that we're really looking closely at in terms of an oper- at the operational right. level of had, having some had involvement to, with the assassination. Because that is the big question, isn't it? Was mm. Levy, Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone? Um, there's several theories about whether or not... He's been to Mexico uh, to meet the Russians yeah, and all that yeah, kind of stuff. And all, and all of that, and mm. he did seem to speak some kind of Russian. I mean, there's a lot of sort of what you might call circumstantial evidence that, that he was an odd guy, but there's not really very much that pinpoints the CIA involvement. But what you're saying is these files that are being held back may do that. Yes, because we have 5 million pages already because of the Records Release Act. We have a, a great deal of the puzzle already in place. Mm-hmm. What we're looking for is the, to, to fit some remaining pieces in. But the, the uh, Castro connection and the KGB connection were part of a pre-existing plot before the assassination to tie Oswald 
to the KGB and to Castro and to uh, thereby mm. create the threat of a nuclear holocaust, World War III, mm. which uh, President Johnson used to bamboozle, to browbeat our chief justice into taking the job uh, to head up the commission and whose job was to, to find nothing. Mm. Yeah, I, I understand that. John, talking about um, Lyndon Baines Johnson, there are some, you know, hints or, or references or questions being asked. Was he behind the assassination plot? I thought that was a, a crazy theory that disappeared half a century ago. Yeah, well, it, it, you have to be careful about your language. No, I don't believe he, when you say behind, that means sort of intimately involved in kind of directing the action. No, I don't believe that. But I think he had to be told at some point. After all, he was going to be the top cop. Mm. And so I don't think this was his idea. Uh, I don't know the degree of his complicity, but certainly he had to know. And had to know of... about what? Had to know about the intended assassination? Yes. Well, Maybe not as early as January 63, but certainly in November. November the previous year, no. 62. So you think he was aware of the fact that a plot was being hatched? Only at the last moment. Mm. I don't see him as being involved in the original planning and, and all of that, creating the opportunities. But he, he, they had to bring him in at some point. But John, what, what have you seen? Good. What have you seen, John, in these papers? Mm. Right, that brings yeah. that that brings that sort of conspiracy theory off, yeah. any closer to reality? Because we've heard all these theories before. We've now got some papers. Well, I'm talking related. about facts. I'm talking about uh, listening to tape recorded conversations between Johnson and Senator Russell. And Johnson explaining literally hours, just hours after the assassination, uh, about what they needed to do. He knew that Oswald had been impersonated uh, on Friday. And I don't know how he, he would know that, because that information didn't come out until later in the weekend. So Johnson knew way too much, okay, in documents, uh, conversations with Hoover, telephone uh, conversations, which we can listen to and have been able to now for 20 years. And what about mm. patrolman J.D. Tippett, the guy who ended up being gunned down by Oswald, if it was Oswald, um, shortly yeah. after the assassination? Was he involved in any way? Unfortunately, I can't help you too much in Dealey Plaza. Uh, my specialty is really the people who were behind this uh, thing, and I don't get into uh, x-rays and bullets and how many shooters. I'm into finding out who was behind the Okay. Mm. What about this mysterious phone call that's been revealed uh, in the papers about uh, the Cambridge newspaper that got a telephone call, supposedly? Cambridge, England. Somebody saying there was some big news about 25 minutes ahead of the assassination. Do you put any credence on that? I do not know about that. Sorry. Mm. Oh, okay. Apparently a caller called the Cambridge News... Uh, and England. said, basically, 25 minutes before the assassination mm. actually took place in real time, uh, call the American embassy uh, in London Something because there's some happening. big news coming. I mean, it might be, just be one of these coincidences. Yeah, it's, uh, if we could link it up to some other, you know, other evidence. Mm. I, I believe in independent attestation. When you get something very uh, you know, big like that, you have to have another source. Well, it's, it's, it's very bizarre. But, but, John, without the remaining papers now, we're never going to solve this riddle if there is a riddle, are we? I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think we've already got most, uh, most of the story. Yeah. Um, but what... Well, if we've got... We sorry, have. John, if we've got most of the story, who, in your uh, opinion, then, was responsible for the assassination of John F. Kennedy? OK, so I'm interested in who's really behind it. I don't care who's shooting down there, and whether Oswald was or... Yeah, so who's behind it? Probably were more so at the operational level, I would, I would uh, be very interested in David Phillips, uh, David Sanchez Morales, um, who was down in J.M. Wave. Uh, yeah, I, but which uh, political organisation? Was it the Russians? Was it the CIA? Well, was it some far-right conspiracy what party? Was what was it? Uh... We're going a little too fast here. Uh, I'm, I think we've done a good job of identifying participants at the operational level. As we move up the pay grades here, I, I'm looking at Alan Dulles and um, James Jesus Angleton, head of counterintelligence and, and the director. I'm right now in volume three of a five-volume series that st uh, started on uh, in uh, 2012. And probably not going to finish it until 2022. It's a, it's it's hard police work. But I am actually now looking at the, the Wall Street law firms that the Dulles brothers were sitting on the boards of that had 
people represented the interests of all those cattle farms, all those sugar companies, all those oil companies, mm. all the, the casinos down there in, in Cuba. The arms companies. Uh, because I guess what you need to mm. establish so as I well. Think that the Wall Street has got the past mm. uh, in, in the investigations of uh, our research community. And I'm no longer willing to do that. I've already I'm, I'm looking very carefully at wall street as well right as but what's the motive exactly because obviously in any situation where somebody's mm. murdered well i just i just i just mentioned that a lot of uh companies that all went away tens of billions of dollars were lost by people who were very angry and banging on the doors of the state department mm. uh, because of the castro problem yeah so, well, uh, well not only that okay, but i mean ahead. you know maybe the vietnam war wasn't moving fast enough for the arms companies and they wanted to speed it up or something i don't know That's but i mean true yeah yeah. That's true, but it, that's re- that's relatively late in the game. It isn't until yeah. '63 that that starts that argument begins to heat up. Mm. Uh, the Cuban story is a little more central. Mm. Bay of Pigs was huge in terms of a, a yeah. cataclysmic, uh, you know, continental continents crashing into each other. The world mm. changed. Mm. John, let me ask, let me ask you one final question because we're out of time, sadly, and we could talk about this probably all day. Um, can you categorically rule out, for example, the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone? No, I don't. Like I said, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not interested in how many shooters. I, 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 my no, I'm talking about how he acted alone in terms of he acted alone in terms of there was nobody behind the it. Motivation. It wasn't a conspiracy. There wasn't any companies involved. It had nothing to do with Wall Street or Cuba. It was just one guy who assassinated the president. Yes, I can categorically rule that out. Uh, I've written two volumes now on all, uh, how his files were doctored up and they were hidden uh, in the weeks before the assassination. I've written two two books about that. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed. John Newman, author and political science professor at James Madison University in Virginia. Mm. Now, uh, we could talk about this all day, I'm sure. Um, It's very difficult to know, really, when we've seen these uh, these papers that have Mm. been released. Mm. I don't think we've learned anything more. I mean, John clearly has had these beliefs before these papers came out. John was introduced to us as the author and political science professor at James Madison University in Virginia. Yes. He doesn't go into lecture theatres and spout all that drivel that he's just been giving us to to students, does he? No, I don't think he's well, he's written two books on it. OK, he's written two books on it, mm. so he's got a point of view on it, but there is nothing else in the world to back up those well, I think you'd theories have to see... about, you know, the agricultural firms, well, I think the you'd farmers... Have to see his and... evidence. Well, what, it's, what his well, evidence is, right, mm. is that it's absolutely clear yeah. that Lee Harvey Oswald, in his view, mm. did not act on his own. Mm. So that's what he's saying. But he hasn't got any evidence for it. Well, you don't know that. You'd have to read the books. Well, I asked him directly, Maybe who, wants behi- I asked him directly yeah. who wants behind it, yes. and he just trails off a load of could-bes, maybe's, yeah. might-bes. Right. He didn't say, well, I've got why. comprehensive evidence. Well, this is why. Yeah. I pointed out at mm. the end, mm. can you categorically mm. rule out one yeah. thing, which is Lee Harvey Oswald actually alone? He said he mm. could. So therefore, that's one in thing his that we opinion. know. Well, that's one thing that we know. And maybe next time you're walking past a Waterstone, you can go and buy one of his books mm. instead of a book about North American Indians, which yeah. is no interest to man or beast. Yeah. You see that I've put out the... I'd uh, like to see the receipt, please, and I'm going to look at it as we come out the, of the next break. The, the receipt has gone out to the public who well, are listening in their billions I'd now. like to have the receipt in my hand. They please. know that I'm an honest man. <laughs> my <laughs> virtue is intact. You've never been honest in your life. This is Talk Radio. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. It's a wonderful night. Gotta take it from me. It's a wonderful night. Come on and break it on down. It's a wonderful night. Gotta shake it from me. It's a wonderful night. Come on and break it on down. It's a wonderful night. Everybody can see. This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. The Borky Quiz coming up a little bit later on. Also, we are going to be talking to our good friend, Mr. Brian Vine of the Daily Mail we Film certainly Critic. certainly are. Because uh, a new film out called Breathe, I want to yeah. ask you about. But I also want to ask you about this new Thor film as yeah, well. Yeah, sure. Because apparently everybody's been raving about what great film it is. We went to see last it. night, yeah. I did, yeah. Great well, all, personal all, all the reviews of it say it's, it's made the action heroes even better, you well, know? Well, I mean, you know, it's yeah. got some humour. It's just yeah. it's yeah. very hard to take seriously films like that. But, yeah. you know, if you're into it, I suppose it's a good thing. Mm. Now, what I want to talk to you about, though, is this receipt uh, that you've produced this yes. morning. Morning, right yes. after being put under some pressure to prove that you weren't lying. Yes. Okay. Now, which first I've of all, now proved. Yesterday, you said mm. that you bought the book in Epsom. Okay. Yes. Uh, this receipt is from a bookshop in High Street, Sutton. Yes, that's right. Seventy-one to eighty-one. Yes. Uh, SM one one ES. That's right. That is not Epsom. No, that's the that's the HQ. That's the central one. That's where th- th- Waterstones the... HQ is in Sutton. Uh, no, is that your yeah, claim? Uh, absolutely. And so, I'll... did you buy the book in Epsom or Sutton? I bought the book in uh, Stockbroker Belt, Surrey. No. Did you buy? Yeah. In Epsom or Sutton? Uh, I think it was Sutton. I think, think it was Sutton on recollection. So when you said on Epsom, that yeah. was a lie. 
No, it wasn't a lie. It was that I was in Epsom yesterday. Or sorry, on the day Wednesday, uh-huh. and uh, and I bought several things there. But uh, really? my memory must be clouded. It must have been your sudden. memory must be clouded. Yes. So, what else did you buy in Epsom when you were there? Uh, what else did I buy in Epsom? Yeah. In Epsom, I bought... I didn't buy anything in Epsom. You just said you bought lots of things in Epsom. I did. I went into uh, WH Smith's. Yes. And I bought uh, some of my journals from WH Smith's. Some journals. That's right, yeah. Okay, do yeah. you have a receipt from there? No, we don't get receipts for journals, no. Why not? Well, because I can't be bothered with all the paperwork in my pocket, so okay. I don't bother, okay? Now, it says here that this, pay, this, uh, yeah. this book was paid for with a receipt... Uh, sorry, with a credit card. Yes. Uh, which ends in what looks like... Um, where are we? Um, zero, 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 zero. Right. Barclay card visa. Okay. Do you have that card? Uh, maybe. I don't know. I don't know the numbers of my credit cards. your card number? Uh, I, I have no I'm idea. I'm just concerned because knowing no, your no history, idea. right, knowing yeah. your ability to twist the truth yes. and your rat-like cunning, yes. it does not escape my notice. You might not have gone into this shop mm-hmm. and asked them to give you one of their spare receipts from no. Wednesday, Rubbish. despite the fact that you didn't actually buy anything. Rubbish. Isn't the name of the book on the receipt? Uh, the name of the book is not on the receipt, no. Oh, well, I thought it was. No, but, uh, all anyway, it says it doesn't is bother me. CP sale. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, but I mean, look, I've got a picture of the book. I put it out this morning. That the means earth nothing. is weeping. That means nothing. Now, where would I have got that from? Do you well, think I suddenly sort of started well, walking around bookshops yeah. taking pictures of books? Well, you could have done that when, this be morning ridiculous. before you came in because Don't you're be so ridiculous. scared of being exposed as a cheat liar. Not at all. Not at all. Because already mm. uh, people have been questioning the look of the book, saying it looks as if it's just a dust cover and no, there's actually no, no book no. inside it. Not at all. Not really? at all. Okay. Uh, and, and by the course, way, I told you it was 18 quid. Yes. I mean, I hadn't sold myself. It was actually £25 and 5p. So that was wrong as well. N- well. So you've got the venue wrong. Mm. You've got the amount wrong. Uh, mm. the, the receipt does not actually mention that this is the name of the book. So mm. I'm sorry. Mm. If I was in a court of law, yeah. I would reject this out of hand. This well, is not proof that you bought that book. Uh, it, but it's not proof that I didn't. It is. It, uh, I well, can... you're the one that has to provide the proof. Look, I swear on, you know, the life <laughs> of, you know, of all, all that is good. That, you don't know uh, anything that's good. Yeah, that, uh, I bought that book and that's the receipt. I and see. you now owe me an apology. Well, no, I don't. Because I've proven no. that I'm an honest man. No, well, first of and all... And you've challenged my virtue no, again. You, li- you lied about where you bought it. No, I you didn't. You lied about the price. No, I didn't. Uh, you may well have lied about the whole thing. What I would like to see is the back cover of the book, which proves that that book actually does cost £25.05. pence. Well, I haven't got it here Why with haven't me. you taken a picture of the price of the book? Why would I? I don't want to boast about the price of the book. I just, t- I just told you that was the book I got. Anyway, I wasted too much time on this. <laughs> because it is completely and utterly <laughs> Necessary. Talking about, not... talking about books and uh, and things that appear in writing. Yes. Did you know that the editor of Russia's most prominent independent newspaper mm. is now actually thinking of issuing his reporters, yeah. like you and I used to be, you yeah. know, in Fleet Street uh-huh. and Scotland yes. and Manchester, mm. with guns? Really? Yeah, to protect themselves. And they go on the, the streets uh, of this is the Moscow. Pra- is, does Pravda still exist, by the way? No, I it? don't think it does. Does it not? No, this the is. was the Communist Party paper, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it was. It was. I mean, Pravda wasn't a newspaper. Yeah. It was a daily bulletin of uh, how Russian people must think about yeah. things. Right. But this is an independent paper. It's called Novoya Gazeta, oh, OK? Yeah. And uh, because so many journalists are under threat in Russia, for instance, recently, Tatyana Felganagor, uh, who was a presenter at Moscow's Echo Mosky V radio station, she was stabbed on Monday. Yeah. Suffered a deep knife wound to her neck and is recovering in the hospital. Rush me. The Russian uh, journalists are under attack all over the place. Yeah. So the uh, the actual um, editor here, a guy called uh, Mr. Muratov. Yes. OK. Um, what's his first name? His first name is Dmitry. That's a great Russian name, Dimitri's isn't it? a great Russian name, it's like, yeah. it's like the, That's the equivalent of David It's also Russia. a Greek name as well, isn't it? Dimitris. Uh, well, I'm not sure. Mm. But Dmitry Moratov uh, has told his reporters, I'm going to get your guns because you've got to be able to protect yourself, OK? See, the trouble with that, though, is that yep. I've always wondered about the, the possibility of carrying a gun. If you carry a gun, yep. there's always a much greater chance of you being mm. shot with your own gun, mm. isn't there? Oh, yeah, there is, yeah. But actually, what's happened here is, I mean, it's a strange society in Russia. After Mr Moratov's comments, right... Yeah. Um, an organisation called Kalishnikov Concern. Right. Now, Kalishnikov, of course, is the rifle uh, invented by, by General Kalishnikov. Kalishnikov. Yeah. That's right, yeah, to fight... Isn't it Kalashnikov? Uh, Kalashnikov, I think yeah. you're right, yeah. So after Mr Mordov's comments, Kalashnikov Concern, um, who are the company who make Kalashnikovs, OK, yeah, right. they suddenly start contacting journalists and saying, uh, we'll offer you a 10% discount on... Uh, well, on the gun, the handguns? Yeah, yeah, on our weapon, right. which is the MP8013. It's called the Traumatic Pistol, and it fires 
0.45 rubber bullets. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, if want, well, if you want to have a gun, surely you want a real gun. Well, you I suppose a rubber, a rubber bullet gun. would keep people at bay, wouldn't it? You well, know what I mean? Yeah, but if they've got a proper gun, you know, it's a bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight, isn't it? it uh, I suppose it is, yeah. I once found a rubber bullet in the street in Belfast. Yeah, well, that's not yeah, surprising. Yeah, well, exactly. They used to shoot them there. Yeah, yeah they did. Yeah, they used to use mm. a lot of them there. Yeah. But uh, I tell you what, it's no, it's no fun being hit by a rubber bullet. No, I'm sure it isn't. You can smash your face to pieces. Well, I mean, they were using them in Catalonia, weren't they? Much to the yes. chagrin of the protesters. Yes, that's who right. Just trying to go out and vote. That's right. Uh, who said that they were being attacked yeah. and being hot shot with rubber bullets? No, yes. I'm sure that's very, very painful. That's right. Mm. Uh, Mr. Moratov's initiative uh, is being opposed by some of his staff. Yeah. Alina Malashina a reporter who recently had to flee her home after revealing a campaign of persecution by officials against gay men in Chechnya said it was a gesture of depuration. Really? Uh, desperation, yeah. Desperation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I don't think I'd be in favour of carrying a gun, even if I thought there was, I, was some kind of, I was in some kind of danger. What I might do yeah. instead yeah. is have somebody carrying a gun walking beside me. As a, uh, like a bouncer. So you'd like a bodyguard instead? Yeah, I think I'd rather have that, yeah. yeah. Because the problem is, you know, unless you're, you'd have to be taught how to use a gun properly, yeah. Yeah. if somebody comes at you with mm. a gun, sure. what are you going to do? Whereas but, if you've got a protector, yeah. I think that's a better idea. But, you know, desperate situations require desperate remedies. True. Six journalists at this paper, Novoya Gazeta, have been killed or have died in mysterious circumstances mm. since 2001. Shocking. So that is shocking, it because is. in Russia, when you die mysteriously, yeah. it may well be because somebody from inside... The yeah, Kremlin that has, has taken a, a uh, rather uh, a dislike to you. Indeed, absolutely mm. right. Fortunately, the world of journalism in this country is not quite so dangerous. Abs- I hope so. Uh, Mike's on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Talk Radio, we are the two mics. Porky Quiz coming up a little bit later on, of course. We'll talk to Brian Viner. Also, we will be talking to a couple of gentlemen who've written a book about drinking around the world. Yes. Now, that's a subject for a Friday afternoon, if ever I thought of one. Absolutely. Uh, Joel Harrison and Neil Ridley, uh, winners of the Fortnum and Mason Drink Book of the Year. Wow. How come how, we haven't thought of this? No, oh, no. You, you how come pass we, that copy to me, well, please. How come because, we have you know, not, well, I've marked uh, a couple of things in it, because yeah, I want to talk yeah. about New York City, yeah, sure. places to go to drink. We're in South America, we're in Lovely. Helsinki, Dublin. Yeah, I've drunk in um, South America, you know. Well, I'm glad, but you might see if you can Recognise Barra, some of the places. Barachalochi in uh, Argentina, up a mountain. It was up brilliant. a mountain, yeah. yeah. That's right. Is it Chile. true that if you drink in high altitude, you get drunk quicker? Absolutely right. Because absolutely. it's all about alcohol in the it, bloodstream, It is, isn't yeah, it? it is, absolutely right. Mm. Uh, Chile in the Andes, I've yeah. drunk, yeah. OK. Um, in Rio, But obviously. why have we not written a book about drinking around the world? Well, I don't suppose we've had time, really, have we? It's a trick, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, drinking. yeah. Anyway, yeah. Miner says this. Why did Porky go to Epsom's WH Smiths when there's a big branch in Sutton? Uh, well, um, uh, Mark says I the, move book's, around. the book's name is not on the receipt. Porky can't lie straight in bed. No, no, no. I'm telling you that anybody who questions my honesty and what I've said here now will <laughs> have me to answer to if they start spreading these foul rumours. Well, I'm afraid that your reputation has preceded you, you see, no. because the problem is that nobody believes a word you say. Mm. I thought mm. Porky was half blind that day walking around wearing his shades. Now, that's a very good point. This yeah. is from Donovan. Because yes, remember we that's met, true. We, we, I met you in, in Waterloo around about four o'clock. You did? Uh, you would come in on the train from Stockbroker Belt, sir, yes. and you were wearing dark glasses I because was. you said you weren't able to walk around uh, in the sunshine. That's right. Uh, because of the eye exam you just had, no, right? No, that's absolutely right. And now he says it's a bizarre time to go book shopping. Mm. Well, I just happened to be passing the bookshop and I saw it in the window and I thought, that's good. Listen, I'm looking at this drinks book. Yeah. Here's another place I've drunk. Yeah. Reykjavik. Reykjavik, and yes. At this very bar, the Northern Lights Bar at the Ion Adventure Hotel. You've stayed there? I, I haven't stayed there, but I've drunk there. Oh, good. Fantastic. Well, then you can talk to these guys about yeah. it. You'll have plenty to talk about. There's yeah. also another pub that I'm going to be bringing into the conversation, which okay. is the very pub yeah. where the great train robbery uh, plot was Isn't that fantastic? And they've now just got a Michelin star. Yeah. Um, so are we talking about that somewhere in Buckinghamshire? Yes. Uh, Patrick says it's not coincidence that when El Planco is proven wrong he swiftly wants to change the subject. No, that's not true at all. Mm. I never want to change the subject. Okay. Now, we're surely going to be talking to a chef, aren't we, about uh, what I think is a revolting development in uh, the culinary life of this country. That's right, yeah. And it's disgusting. You don't like pig's heads roast. Well, I I, I, I came across this in one of my journals mm. and I thought, that can't be true. And uh, uh, This is only to do with your nickname Porky. No, nothing to do with that at all. But at dinner parties now in high society 
they just bring a pig's head and they yeah. put it on the table in the middle like you would like a it's roast... It's sort of Elizabethan, isn't yeah, it? Very Elizabethan, you yeah. know, like, like a, a joint of roast beef or something. Yeah. And then somebody gets up and starts going, what would you like? And yeah. somebody says, I'll have an ear. Yeah. An ear apparently tastes like my porky scratchings, you know. Mm. And then somebody else says, no, I'll have a bit of cheek, you know. Or somebody says, I'll have a bit off the back of the neck. Yeah. It's really, but the pig's head is staring so at what you. you doing this. I think this is all about the hypocrisy of people who eat meat. You right. Know? You don't mind giving... You don't mind buying your meat, mm. which is all nicely wrapped up for you in yes. plastic and having well, all the feathers well, that's taken the food off. Chain. That is what the food chain's yeah, all but, about. You know, sometimes you need to see and sometimes you need to understand exactly mm. how the food chain works. And the fact that all of these creatures are horribly murdered yep. uh, in a rather nasty well, they're way. They're not murdered. They, yeah, are, they are. They, they are killed they're because they have to provide food for human meat beings. Meat is murder. That's so what so. Uh, Morrissey says. Yeah, well, yeah. And a lot of people used to chant that, didn't they? Meat is murder. Well, the it one, is, though. The one thing I can't I mean, there's stand. There's no point in pretending that it's not. One thing I can't stand is eating a fish with its head still on. Now, last time I was in Portugal, yeah. you know, he said, oh, you know, the sardines in Portugal are brilliant they are. in the world. They're fantastic. And, and, and I, you have to get them delivered to you whole. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I don't. I say to them, don't bring me any sardines with heads yeah. on. Get their heads well, chopped off. The only sardines you like are the mm. ones that come in on that flat tin where you roll the, the metal back. That is true. And they've had all the bones taken that out. That is true. And they're sitting in brine. Yes, that is and true. And you put them on a sandwich. That is absolutely well, true. Those are not real sardines. Because when you eat the sardines, which are about three times the size of the ones in the tin, mm. uh, in places like uh, Albafura, right? Where? Yeah. Albafura. <laughs> you right? mean Albafura? Albafura, yeah. that's right, yeah. Or Fallow. The, the, the problem is that even when you've chopped the head off and the guy brings it you back, there's a million bones in every, yeah. every sardine. Well, well, some I, of the smaller I don't bones. like eating bones. Bones. Yeah, but some of the smaller bones you can take. You can take out the main bone Ugh. in one in one go. When I was mm. in Greece recently, mm. I had a mm. final dinner and the last night we were there, this yep. beautiful restaurant down by the sea, yes. and I had the most beautiful sea bass, mm. and they brought it whole. Right. And the guy actually said to me as he brought it, would you like me to debone it for you? Yes. So, and I said yes. And so he yes. did it at the table. Debone. So he took all the bones out mm. in a very professional manner. Yes. So that when I ate it, he yeah. said, did say to me there might be a couple left in. Yeah, well, you see, I can't stand so that. So I said, well, hang on. I said, aren't you a professional de boner. That's right. In which case, you should have taken all the bones exactly, out. Exactly. It's no good saying I want, said, I'm very sorry. I want my fish bone <laughs> deboned if you don't get it deboned. Yeah. That's shocking. But it's much better. The flavour is much better. Like with uh, uh, any kind of chop that you eat or any mm. steak that you eat, mm. if you leave the bone in when you cook it, yeah. it actually tastes a lot better. I don't like bones. Well, you I don't, don't like chops. Them. I don't know why people eat chops. Chops are a contract. Chops are 80% bone. You just bone. eat processed food, don't chops you? Chops are 80% bone and a bit of heart of meat in the middle. I don't know why people buy chops. Because the weight that you're buying is yeah. mostly bone, which you don't eat. Yeah, but I've never understood matter. chops. We have never understood no, them. Never understood them, really? no. My mum used to give them to me when I was a kid, and I used to moan and whinge. Have you never had a crown meat on roast? Them. A crown roast? Right, which is the thing that looks like a crown. It's lamb chops. Is that lamb chops? Yeah, I think I've had a circle. Yeah, I think I've had a few of those. Yeah, Yeah. they're quite nice. But I'm talking about, like, you know, uh, when we used to go to um, uh, Palm 2? Yes. What was the big, huge bone in there? Was that a T bone steak, was it? Well, you could get a T bone. Yeah, T bone. uh, You'd often get the prime rib. Prime rib, yeah. Which was, which was cooked a different way. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, mm. but it was, the, it was the T-bone steak I couldn't really yeah. stand. Because... But what's your problem with uh, with people having a pig's head anyway? Well, because it's it's a horrible part of a beast to place on a table when you're eating, and I wouldn't be able to eat in front of that beast staring at Cause me. Because you know in places like Morocco mm. and Algeria, yeah. they're very big on the head of a lamb. Oh, yes, I know. And they eat these sheep's eyes and everything. Well, I've seen that um, I've seen that um, film, um, you know, The Adventurer, uh, The ar- Archaeological Adventurer. You're talking about uh, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones. Jones, you yeah. know, when they go to that feast and yes. there's snakes crawling out mm-hmm. of, you know, yeah, uh, that's fictional, out of the belly of sheep and all this kind of stuff <laughs> at that at that banquet they had. And the, People might the poor be eating woman, lunch listening to this show. Yeah, well, that's this is the point. And the poor woman at the feast, she went mad, didn't mm. she? Because all no, the food was so revolting. Have you ever been to a hog roast? I mean, that's quite popular. No, I don't think I have, actually. Mm. I don't think I have. I mean, to me, a hog roast well, is just the Wiltshire. same as going into um, a kebab shop and seeing guys no, slice no. bits of meat off a, a, a something that's been pressed together from all sorts of false no, meat. No, that's not true, because if you go into a kebab shop and mm. you're talking about Donna Kebab, mm. nobody knows where that comes from, right? Yeah, exactly. They call it sort of an elephant's leg, because yes. nobody's really quite sure how the meat is processed, exactly. how it gets into that shape. But a hog roast mm. is where you've actually got an entire pig mm. or a wild boar or something yeah, on, a, on a spit. Not for me, And you pal. can turn it. Mm. And in fact, I went to one I remember in Wiltshire, yes. and the guy who was holding it had a couple of young kids, five right. or six year old, right. and he had them turning it. Mm. He had the children turning the beast. Uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, well, like a sort of uh, like that was their um, task. 
so yeah. to speak. No, yeah, but that was at also the, their education. At, at the grown up Because I think uh, you have to be careful feast, not to be yeah. too feast about, yeah. about, yeah. Uh, about eating meat. Yeah. If you eat meat, you have to be prepared to understand how it comes to you. Yeah. As opposed to like pretending that it just comes all wrapped up or gets all put in a tin and it's all fine. I'm talking about food, by the way. Mm. There is a huge. Same ab- the time, by the way. Yeah, don't worry about the time. I'm worried about the time. A huge abundance of acorns in this country this year. Okay. So, so whilst you and I talk about food we put on the table, mm. guess what? Go on. The squirrels are going to have a wonderful time because it's a, right. there's a record number of acorns okay. lying around well, we'll in, talk about that, in the we? autumn forest. We'll talk about acorns. There's a record number of, uh, of pound coins as well. Are inundated with them. The reason right. is one of the ones of the natural well, world. Don't tell me now. I've told you, hang on to it okay. for a minute because we've got to stop mm. and uh, you know pay the bills, as it were. Mm. This is Talk Radio. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. Coming up in the next couple of hours, we've got Brian Vine, the Daily Mail film critic, on. We've got the Porky Quiz, uh, which is going to be taken from a Trivial Pursuit game. The, uh, the questions are all going to be sealed. Yes. Uh, we're going to be celebrating Simon Le Bon's birthday, and uh, yes. we're going to tell you how to go about drinking around the world. Mm. Right now, though, uh, we're going to talk about the rich people, who yep. are, of course, Porky's favourite people in the world, those who make an awful lot of money uh, and well, rich people are make usually the world good go around. Well, you say that, but yes. that's a really, really massive... Well, they, cre- uh, they create work for other people. Well, they some create do. wealth, and wealth creators are or what makes the world move forward. Some of them do. Well, let's yeah. talk to Rob Watts, who's from the Sunday Times Rich List, yep. of course, because he's a man that knows an awful lot about the habits of the rich. Rob, a very good uh, afternoon to you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank yeah. you very much Hi, indeed. Rich, thanks for joining uh, what us. What stage are we at with the Sunday Times Rich List? It's not coming out any time soon, is it? Uh, and that's not. Uh, that's, that's absolutely right. Not out till uh, April, May next year. The, the the date of the closely guarded secret. I'd be shot if I uh, if <laughs> yeah. I mentioned it. Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, but my my life has now descended into um, uh, looking at balance sheets, public uh, looking at filings of public companies, and having some extraordinary conversations with these people. Right. Yeah. Do you find that some of them are more uh, likely to help you out with what they have than others? You are absolutely right. So. For um, the Sunday Times Rich List has been going for the best part of 30 years now. Mm. It is seen as a um, uh, matter of sort of public record. Mm. And so they know we're going to do it anyway. They know we're going to have a look at them. They would much rather, generally speaking, that the number was right. So, uh, yes, we have some people who will um, um, not want to talk to us, um, but will grudgingly put, them, put, put us in touch with an accountant. Or we'll have people who will insist on meeting us at, uh, at the Dorchester or somewhere swanky in London and then go through line by line with their assets and you hope that they're telling you what they're telling you is, is right and you, you do your best to, to check that it, uh, that it is. Yeah, I, I find it so am- am- amusing, um, Rob, because some people are always complaining you haven't made them rich enough. And some people are complaining, you've made them too rich. And, of course, they've all got their own motives. We're wanting others to know how rich or poor they are, whether it's a taxman or a business um, associate or something. But you're you're never going to please everybody all the time. Now, the reason we've asked you to come on today is because I've seen this piece here. The super rich are getting wealthier. The assets of the world's billionaires swelled by almost a fifth during the last recorded year, 2016. Uh, The world's uh, 1,542 billionaires... Uh, got by on six trillion US dollars, up seventeen percent on the previous year. It's staggering, isn't it? Mm. Uh, I mean, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing too. It, Ten years ago, seventy million, uh, seventy million pounds would have got you into the Sunday Times Rich list. It would have got you into the top thousand uh, wealthiest people in the UK that we could that we could see. Last this year, you would ne- would have needed one hundred and ten million. We found 77 billionaires in 2012, just, mm. just five years ago. Yeah. We found 134 this year. Mm. And the most staggering one for me, the most staggering statistic for me, that this year there was more wealth we, that we found in the top 50% of the list, the top 500 of the list, mm. than the entire 1,000 just last year, just in 2016. So, yes, yeah. you're right. There are lots of reasons why that's happening, but it, yeah. is, it is galling. Is there yeah. a, a, a sort of a shift in, in, in shall we say, the... Um, I suppose the, the the nationhood of each of these millionaires and billionaires is. Um, are there more foreign uh, millionaires in London now than there ever were? We're definitely seeing more of that. There's no doubt about that. Why are they coming to the London? Coming to London, lots of reasons. They want to educate their children here. 
Um, they, 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 they want to be close to the city. Um, the wealth management industry is a big draw for them. Uh, cultural things, Wimbledon, Lord's Cricket Ground, all sorts, of, all sorts of reasons. So that is definitely a shift. We are seeing more foreign money, but we're also seeing a real shift away from old money and from a small number of sectors dominating the list, you know, big industrialists yeah. or finance or property. And we're seeing people from all walks of life. We had two billionaire car dealers in the rich list this, this Golly, year. That's incredible. Yeah. We had two yeah. two brothers from um, from the north of England who opened a petrol their first petrol station just before year two thousand. Mm. The Easter brothers mm. are now worth more than a billion pounds um, between them, having created that business. Uh, this morning, I was looking at a pet food business. Mm. Um, you know, and we'll wanna, you know, one we're, 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 get, uh, we're yet get into the world of the yeah. billionaires' rankings, but we're seeing more and more what I would call real world economy mm. Um, mm. Uh, businesses, entrepreneurs out there, and that's I, I think that's inspiring. Whatever walk of life. You're in that there is probably someone who's doing very very well. Oh, absolutely! And and the amazing thing is, Rob, I think you've just told us unless you've got over a hundred million, you don't get into the Sunday Times rich list. Now, is that right? Well, you would have needed we, we you and I would have needed one hundred and ten million. Yeah, okay, year. there you go. So you're not going to make it this year. Not going to make it this year. Only yet, just and, missing and, it. And yet, to most people, if you stop most people in any high street in any town in this country and said, "Would you fancy being a millionaire?" That would be enough for most people, wouldn't it? Well, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, that's, well, that, that's the thing that sometimes makes me scratch my head more than anything, is that these people keep going year yeah. after year yeah. after year. And I think that what, what that tells us is, is you know, people like Dyson, for example, mm. James, um, Sir James Dyson. Yes. You know, we, we, we value him at 7.8 billion pounds. Yeah. Um, I don't know many people who could burn through that amount of cash in their lifetime. It, it, of course they're not. Mm. He's not motivated by money. Mm. He's motivated by problem solving, things that, that, that interest him and fascinate him. Yeah. Things like artificial intelligence, robotics, trying to sort out electric cars and get mm. the batteries working properly so we can use them. And increasingly, when you talk to these people, you, you see that actually the money is a product, it's a byproduct, but it's not what get, makes them get out of bed at five o'clock in the morning or no. fly halfway around the world. No, it's, it's Is there not an element solving. of a competition amongst some of these guys as well? I mean, particularly the ones, for example, that want to meet you and tell you precisely how much they've got. Presumably they put quite a great uh, store on being fifth rather than tenth. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, that is a, a perennial hazard with, with, with this job is that they're, they're people who move in the same circles who feel aggrieved that they were below someone they're at school with someone who they, they, they did business with a few years ago. And, uh, yes, we, you know, the readers deserve the most accurate list that we can possibly put together. So we have to be very, very careful to uh, take with a pinch of salt when some people are arguing to be pushed higher. Mm. And then on the flip side, you've got people who, are, who sometimes ring us up, make contact with us, who are, who are trying to, to, to push themselves lower. Perhaps they've got a divorce coming up. Yeah, or, or a taxman <laughs> knocking on the door or something like that. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, of course, in the recent years, the amount of billionaires who are so young because they are brilliant minds who come out of university without even completing a degree and invent things like Facebook. Yes, that's right. We haven't had so many of those um, here in the UK um, no. yet, but we will start to see them. We're starting to see them just filter into the, to the bottom of the list mm. um, in particular. But yes, that's, that's definitely one of the trends that we're looking at. We've got a, a couple of new technology um, entries, um, people in their, in their 30s who will have in next year's list, I can, I can tell you. I think I can tell you that without yeah. getting into trouble. Sure, sure. No, I'm, 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 and then wealth generates wealth, doesn't it? Because if you're sitting on a pile of 7.4 billion pounds like you said yeah Mr. but a lot of the billionaires and millionaires yeah. who are on the Sunday Times rich yeah. list who have got loads of money here mm. might be employing people in other countries right oh, oh yeah sure but the thing is if you're getting interest of five percent on 7.8 billion then your wealth is just growing all the time isn't it it's exactly right and often um it, it's the 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 way or the the thing that someone is known for is not really where they make their actual fortune. So Lord Sugar, for example, mm. um, you, you know, you may remember the computers, you may remember the emailers. But it's all Actually, property where now, he's isn't it? Really made his money is London property. Yeah, that's and right. Some yeah. Very very savvy deals. Yes, exactly. I mean, he's built up, uh, he's bought up huge trenches. I think of Piccadilly and places like that. You know, with the property company run by one of his sons, a very yeah. very shrewd and clever man. But when I see, you know, Paul. McCartney worth 750 million. I always think to myself, well, hang on, when he goes to bed at night, that 750 million 
is accumulating at 5% every moment of his life. You're fascinated by this, I aren't am, you? yeah. And, and it's five, the only thing you get enthusiastic and about. Five, 5% of 750 million is about 175 million. So, uh, sorry, of, uh, of his uh, 750 million. Yeah, 10% would be 75. It's about 35 million. So it's gaining, like, by the day at about a million pounds. Yeah, I mean, that... that- of course that he's doing nothing with that money and what I think is very striking with uh, the rich list is the the turnover is that the people dropping in and dropping out Mm. and through what what seem even to the layman a really naive investment or acquisition um, which ends up you know since it sees them plummeting down the list Mm. and we I mean we there's a billionaire I was looking at this morning who's uh, main um, financial company has the profits have halved mm. um, in the uh, in the last year. We can't value that business at, at a billion pounds um, anymore. So it, there are it's a revolving door. I think what we, we increasingly see with the rich list is that mm. people from from different walks of life, but we see people dropping in, people dro- dropping out, and that yeah. that seems to suggest to me that that's healthy. You wouldn't want you know people necessarily staying entrenched on the rich list just no. year after year after year after year. No. Can, can it be possible to suck so much money out of the world economy because you're so brilliant at, get, at uh, um, uh, obtaining it that the world economy will suffer? Because didn't that happen in Saudi Arabia sort of 30, 40 years ago? They had so much petro, how many petrodollars, the world economy s- uh, slumped. Well, that PwC report would, today was arguing that um, I think 98% of um, the, the, the billionaires' wealth finds its way back into the economy. I, I don't really recognise that figure, but uh. I think there certainly is a lot of truth in the idea that this money doesn't stay exactly where you... Uh, well, that it does filter out. And yeah. you'd expect me to say that these people create jobs. Yes, of course mm. they do. You'd expect me to say that they pay a lot of tax. Yes, they do. But you'd expect me to say that these people have lots of foundations, that they, they do as well. Mm. But, but the, 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 the cumulative effect is quite dramatic. I mean, if you look at someone like John Cordwell, do you remember John Cordwell, the phone for you guy? Yes. Um, avid cyclist. He um, he gave two hundred and fifty three million. Or gave he paid two hundred and fifty three million pounds worth of tax mm. in uh, in four years. He, he said he, he said he must be in the revenues um, mm. um, best buddy. Um, that's not the sort of amount of cash that that pays for a few nurses. It's the sort of cash that builds hospitals. And yeah, I it think is. Mm. it is easy to miss that in this whole world of the. If you focus on the bling and you focus on the numbers, you, you can miss that the actual the, the effect that yes, they do contribute uh, a lot of a lot to our public finances, but sure. they often inspire a lot of people as well. Yeah, great, absolutely right. Well, mm. listen, thank you very much indeed. The rich list out next year, Rob. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Avid cyclist and billionaire. Surely that's a bit of a quandary for you, Porky. What's that? Like? <laughs> the guy's an avid cyclist. You yeah, hate yeah. cyclists, yeah, well, but no. you love rich people. Well, so what's the real? Well, rich people who cycle are good cyclists. Are they? Yes, but I, I, I don't like the people who cycle around uh, London and never use the uh, cycle lanes, right. which then prevent traffic from moving through yeah. London, which then blocks so the short development. I was looking for blocks the development of yeah. the economy. Yeah, it's mm. too late for that. Mm. Uh, this is Talk Radio. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. In touch with the ground, I'm on the hunt I'm after you. Smell like a sound, I'm lost in a crowd. Hunt down, hungry like the wolves. Straddle the line, discord and rhyme. I'm on the hunt I'm after you. Talking of the Sunday Times Rich List, yes. I wonder if Simon Le Bon's going to be on it. Well, uh, he will. Um, he'll rate amongst the sort of rock star lead, won't he? I would have thought so. They've been around for so long, and they're still touring, aren't they? They still make a bit of money. Yeah, that's right. I saw them at their first uh, when they were first famous at the Rum Runner Club in Birmingham. Oh yeah, when I worked on the Birmingham Evening Mail. My God, that is a long yeah, time ago. It is a long time ago, but that's mm. all they did, and then they suddenly became world famous. Yeah, I saw them on their sort of first comeback tour. Oh yeah, uh, only because I, I was in New York at the time. 
and uh, yeah. they were being managed by our friend Pete Rudge, oh, right, who used yeah, to manage yeah. the Rolling Stones. Yeah. This is the guy yeah. uh, who had uh, uh, unfortunately racked up so many tax bills mm. that the IRS in America, the mm. Internal Revenue Service, mm. actually audited him and told him that he couldn't write a cheque unless they co-signed it. Right, he owed yeah. them a million quid, right? <laughs> right yeah. Because the Stones had done some tour mm. um, and he hadn't paid any tax. No, and right, he went to Mick yeah. Jagger and yeah. said, look, Mick, I've got this problem with trouble. the IRS. Mm. You know, do you think you could shoot me a million quid mm. over? Mm. And he said, no. <laughs> well, remember, that might have been in the days when the Stones themselves were getting heavily ripped off by promoters all well, over, I don't think all it over was. the world. I mean, it I was because they got that guy, Prince Von, whatever his name was. Oh, yeah, they? the Dutch guy. Yeah. Uh, no, was he Dutch? I, no, I think he was British. He was, was a British aristocrat. But he had a Prince Von something name. And he took hold of their finances and turned them into like hundred yeah. millionaires. You know well, what I mean? all I know is, is that, yeah. you know, considering that a million pounds to Mick Jagger is probably not an awful lot of money. Yeah, but it to might Pete have been Rudge, in those days. Because... But to Pete Rudge, it yeah. was his entire life. Well, that's right. Well, yeah. And it took him two years to get out from under it and he suddenly found yeah. himself as the manager of Duran Duran. Oh, right. And we were in Costello's one night and yeah. he came in yeah. and was talking to various people, all of mm. whom were much older than me, of course. Yes. Yes. And uh, he said, do you really fancy coming up and watching Duran Duran? I was mm. like, I'll come. Where was it? It was up at somewhere up on uh, sort of Midtown somewhere. Yeah, right. It was quite okay. a, not a massive venue. And was this their comeback tour? It was their sort of first comeback right, tour. Yeah. So yeah. it would have been like late 80s, mm. early 90s, something like that. Right, okay. And they were actually rather good, but the yeah. place was full of teenage girls fainting. Yeah, well, which it I would found be, yeah. rather strange. Well, Simon Le Bon was a heartthrob. It's his he, birthday today or something. He's 59 today. Yeah. So that's why we played that music. Mm. And wasn't, weren't they new romantics? Do you remember? Uh, I suppose they were, yeah. You know, they first yeah. guys who put makeup on on stage yeah. and all that kind of stuff, mm. weren't they? They were. Nick Rhodes, was he one of them? Uh, Nick Rhodes, I think yeah, so, yeah. He was, yeah, yeah, like a yeah. keyboard player. John Taylor was another one. John Taylor was another one, definitely, yeah. That's right, yeah. He married some crazy girl, I think, who, uh, she was, at the age of 16, she was one of these sort of, you know, um, it girls. Oh, I know. Who used to dance on pianos. Samara, like Amanda. Some, was it Amanda. Samara? No, it was Amanda somebody. Amanda Cadenet. Amanda Cadenet. Amanda, Amanda, Amanda Cadenet. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah, one. she ended up in L.A. She did, yeah. I seem right, to remember. Yeah. In fact, I think I ended up out for dinner with her one night. When oh, really? In Los Angeles, yeah. Oh, I mean, go. not just me and her, but a no, few people. A few people, yeah. Interesting it, times. With, with the in crowd, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, good. Absolutely right. Right. Now. Go on. Um, talk about the in crowd. Yeah. Uh, oh, hang on, we've got to speak to Oliver Dado Indeed, first, indeed we uh, must, because yeah. Because he's been waiting patiently for us, he has. Uh, and we've completely ignored him, so that was the wrong thing to do. Mm. Oliver, a very good afternoon to you. Many apologies. No worries, Mike. How are you both? Yeah, yeah, very, well very well we indeed. We last spoke to you uh, during the election, I think, election night, when you were very we kindly uh, informing mm. us about some count that you were at. Uh, things have not gone well since then, you'd have to say. Yeah, um, it's been problematic for Theresa May, for her party. Mm. You could say for the country if the, the current predictions um, are to be believed. And then obviously things in, in terms of Brexit don't look any particularly any closer to, to resolution. No. And I would say problems as well for Europe, for mm. Catalonia, for Scotland. I mean, the reverberations have been enormous, haven't they? Yeah, um, I mean, instability, instability, Europe, Europe-wide, um, you know, in America, all the all the problems mm. that we're seeing, um, rise of populism, rise of um, breakaway movements. Um, it's just, it's it's a tough time in in global politics, but also a great time to be a politics student. Which well, is I suppose so. And you're at the University of Nottingham, Oliver. And, mm. and, and I mean, one of the reasons we got you on is to is to sort of follow up from yesterday, where we had mm. Porky's uh, um, uh, local MP on talking it's about Paul the. Uh, talking about the kind of um, what he would regard as the sort of invidious propaganda, propaganda which is being handed out at our, at our schools of learning in this country. I mean, what is the situation? Is it right to say, I don't think it is, but you can tell me, that most lecturers are left-leaning and are more likely to be remoners than uh, anything else? Well, I think that the numbers show that actually... On balance, we are more likely to be left leaning and Ramonas. However, and I think this is the, the key point, the um, the issue of bias and so on overlooks the fact that that, that assumes we have a, a huge ability to influence our students to our way of thinking. And that it also assumes that we want to do that. And, and the funniest thing is, and, and, and I talk to colleagues of all different political persuasions in my department, actually our aim is to help our students think critically, not to tell them what to think. So actually this depiction of them, um, and the word dons should be expunged the English language, the picture of these dons from the 1920s in Oxbridge um, with our students hanging on our every word. Um, half the time we can't get them to turn up to lectures and seminars. Mm. And when we do, they are bright, intelligent, 
engaged people who they're not just brainless sops who soak up what we say like sponges um mm. and on the on the letter that was written to vice chancellors i actually showed the letter to my students mm. two of them came up to me after a lecture and asked had i seen it of right. course i had mm. i think they were hoping that i was going to be shipped off to a re-education camp somewhere to get out of <laughs> class for a while um but they they actually wanted to discuss the letter so we did in class um and and they they were all quite offended at the way that this mp was seeming to imply that they were just there like sponges to take whatever we said as read without challenging us. I mean, they, they'd see through me in a flash if I started just to propagandise. Sure. <laughs> but there must, still be, there must still be an effect. I mean, it's a bit like people who say, oh, advertising doesn't influence anyone. I mean, if you're in a situation where the only um, sort of view that you are given, albeit that you're encouraging their views to maybe be different, but the only view mm-hmm. that you're being given from a, a, a figure of authority is one particular point of view, you know, it's going to have influenced you, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it would do if that was if that was what we were what we were doing. I think as I mean, as I teach Brexit, what I do is take I, I give all students we we end by looking at all the campaign materials on each side, um, and what we do is we try to study the long historical trends that have given rise to the debates that unfolded in 2016. So what we what we're really not doing is, is taking a position on whether it was right or wrong. We're trying to understand the long term causes, consequences developments in the party system, um, in society as a whole, to try to make sense of this issue. So in our own opinion, um, it it can obviously be communicated in students, and I'm quite happy to talk to my students about my opinions, but in terms of how we grade them um, and and the written work we ask them to do, we're actually looking to, we're judging them not on whether they agree with us, um, otherwise all my students would be Liverpool fans, and I, I know Mike Parry would love that. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> well, you'd have a hard time convincing them to be Everton fans at the moment, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but that's but even worse time. than us, but, even worse than us. Yeah. So, but, yeah, it, it, the students, I've, I've been looking with mm. my students at different periods in, in history since 50s on, and we've mm. taken a vote each week, and what, we've, what I've found is, Pretty much 100, 90 to 100 percent of my students have all agreed that Britain, Britain shouldn't have joined originally and was right to be kept up by de Gaulle. Mm. And they're not much keener on the idea of Britain um, particularly staying in now, it seems. Yeah. So, in fact, if I'm a Remainer who's propagandising, I'm the worst propagandist for Remainer because I mm. produced a load of Eurosceptics. Yeah, amazingly, de Gaulle didn't want us to join originally because he said we're an island state and we mm. wouldn't uh, feel comfortable inside the uh, European Union, didn't he? But, Oliver, yeah. I, think, I think it's a wider question. You see, you know, all this. Uh, these issues we've been hearing about in the last couple of years about, you know, students wanting to get rid of Cecil Rhodes statue, you know what I mean? And all this kind of stuff. I mean, don't students have any regard for history? You can't unravel history. Cecil Rhodes, whatever he is looked back upon, didn't know what he was doing at the time he was doing it, and he sent a load of money to Oxford and said, yeah, I'll build a college. Now, I mean, you know, he wasn't calculating what he did. I mean, for instance, I went to the King's School Chester, and it was founded by Henry VIII. Now, do you think the students are going to turn around one day and say, right, get rid of Henry VIII's statue? He was statue. a bit of a misogynist. You know, Get rid of Henry VIII's statue because, you know, he didn't have a very good track record with women and he was anti-Catholic. I can I can safely say, Mike, I've never heard any of my students putting these points, uh, but they are, they are astutely, they are pretty historically aware. You know, they do all sorts of different topics, themes and issues. Yes. Um, and, and they would, they, these, that kind of debate is a fascinating one because what we're trying to, certainly in politics departments, we're trying to get them to understand the mechanics of power. Mm. And these are questions about power, authority, who has the right to do what in society and to allocate resources. And, mm. and, and his, history itself, of course, is a hugely political act. Margaret Thatcher was involved in a great national debate about, about national history curriculum in late 80s, yep. early 90s. So, yeah, yeah, this, this issue of, of the statues, commemoration and memorials mm. is actually a really interesting case study which our students would get to use and study from all different perspectives to look at the arguments for and against yeah. and hopefully come up with a critical view, whichever yeah. view that is. We don't really teach one way or the other, mm. but we just ask that they know why they think that and can, and can back it up with evidence, which perhaps some of our politicians should try occasionally. Well, mm. that's not, uh, not, not a bad shout, but I mean, I suppose the bottom line as well, Oliver, is that, um, you know, you're always going to have what seems to be the the, the, the the sort of the great chasm between Remainers and Brexit is because most mm. Remainers still believe, in my estimation anyway, that this isn't going to happen. They actually believe that there will yeah. be some kind of reverse put into effect, that mm. there will have to be at some point another referendum. Just fizzle because, out. Yeah, because, you know, once the, the, yeah. the terms, if the terms are ever agreed, mm. are, are made clear to the British public, we will then have to be asked again whether we accept those terms. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's a parliamentary process. I think the, the, the possibility of a second referendum, I think, is, is really unlikely. I think it's really unlikely. Um, the, reason, the reason is, I think, that the, the politicians have already seen the danger of referendums. And if, the, if Parliament agrees, I think that the, I, my, view, my own view is that another referendum wouldn't be helpful. It's just an incredibly divisive issue. We've seen the switch from 1975 to the present. Um, the divisiveness of this issue means that the debate's going to roll on and on and on and um, whether Theresa May can provide the leadership and part of what my students study is political leadership and mm. what we're finding is a, a vacuum of leadership at the top and a vacuum yeah. of ability to get to grips with the details mm. put an agenda forward negotiate that agenda and sort things out to the satisfaction of, of the majority who voted to leave mm. yeah I mean power vacuums are okay until you try and fill them with the wrong people <laughs> Yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. yeah, well, that's very yeah. true. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's very yeah. true, but it's like the cart before the horse, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We'll have to yeah. leave it there, though, Oliver. Mm. Sorry, we're out of time. Okay. Uh, thank you very no much indeed. Mm. Oliver Daddo there from the University of Nottingham. Uh, this is a debate that's going to go on for a very, very long oh, time. Of course it is. And we will be part of it, of course. Of course we will. Mm. Look across the other side of the Atlantic, mm. all the people who are protesting against Donald Trump. Yeah. But will every woman in America say, oh, by the way, it's all very well, Bill Clinton building a library, because yeah. all presidents build libraries yes. when they leave office, yeah. but women should not use that library. Yeah. I mean, they'd be perfectly entitled well, to say that. A number of they? women I've had conversations with in America about yeah. Bill Clinton yeah. who say, oh, well, we voted for him because he was the best candidate. And you go, well, what about his, his views of women? Track record. And they don't want to know. They don't want to talk about that. No, exactly. That's what I'm saying. That's you Democrats know, for it's, you. It's selective uh, discrimination, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. We've got more coming up, of course. We certainly have. Uh, we're going to be talking about Princess Margaret. We're going to be talking about drinking around the world. This is Talk Radio. This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. Uh, here's one from Pete who says, Surely a few searches through the Porky property should yield enough change to make him a billionaire? Uh, no, nowhere near. I mean, you know, you you make all these false um, statements about me, which is absolutely outrageous. Not true. Point is, because I, you know, um, have a bit of an investment in property, uh, it's what most sensible people would do, except for yourself, of course, who has decided well, to invest I've had your many, money elsewhere. I've had, I've had many investments in property, but yes. I just don't have any at the moment. No, exactly. Currently, exactly. I have no property to speak of. Yes. Uh, Wilco says this, Porky Maths, 5% of 750 mm. million a year mm. is 37.5 million. That's right. The daily interest is about 100,000, not a million a day. Uh, I didn't so say, I said a million a week. A million a week? I said a million a week. Right. So if you well, multiply 100,000, well, it's 700,000 Well, you week. don't count the weekends if I, you're talking banking days. No, I, I counted over 48 weeks in a year, so I got it just about right. Yes. Now, I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about. Go on. Amongst my journals, somebody sent me a book about Princess Margaret. Oh, now, yeah. Do you remember Princess Margaret? Of course I remember her. Yeah, well, She's I, Queen's sister. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but well, I'm not I sure not remember how, her. I'm not sure how many... Well, I'm, you and I remember her, but people maybe of a, a, a younger age perhaps don't. But she was, in fact, the the spare part in the in the royal family, if you see what I mean. Well, we were just talking about the Rolling Stones. I mean, she was yeah. very much a part of the world of, uh, of sort of British rock and roll yeah. and culture from uh, the 60s through the 70s and through the 80s. Yeah, absolutely. The book sent to me says, uh, it's a darkly glamorous tale of a punishing schedule of drinking and smoking, yeah. punctuated by notorious love affairs yeah. with people like Group Captain Peter Townsend, yes. who first met her when she was 14. It's a genuinely sad book. He shunts, he shunted off to Belgium by the authority, so he can't marry her mm. by the establishment. So she then eventually renounces him because she's ordered to. Then she goes off with a photographer called Anthony Armstrong Jones, yeah. who later became Lord Snowden, immortalised as Tony Snapshot, the bitchy name bestowed on him early on by the Earl of Leicester, well, he, he his lifelong to, enemy. He became like a lot of these photographers. Yeah. You know, he's famous for one name. Yes. He would take his picture and it would just say Snowden. That's right, yeah. Which he, was pretty, I mean, he was a pretty cool character. And But he was a dreadful bloke. Um, when, I didn't know. Yeah, OK, well, I'll tell you, when um, when Charles and Diana married, right, the first place they went to was Wales, yeah. because he was called the Prince of Wales. He was indeed. And, and she was well, the... he was the Prince of Wales. She was the Princess of Wales. Was just called that. No, that's right, yeah, it was Prince of Wales. So they go off to places like... I mean, can you believe it? They go off to places like Rill yes. and Prestatin. Prestatin. <laughs> oh, hello, boy. Oh. Which they must you, have really loved. Are you coming home to the beach in yeah. Rill or Prestatin? Yeah. And then they went to places like Conway Castle. The Curry House is quite good. Yeah, the, the Curry House, yeah. And, they, and, and uh, places like uh, Conway Castle, I think it was. Conway. Conway, where he was um, anointed as Prince of Wales when he was 21 no, or something. No, it was Carnarvon Castle. Carnarvon, that's yeah. right, Carnarvon Castle. The investiture. They've got a lot of castles. I remember watching that on television. They were built by Prince uh, by King Edward, weren't they, to keep the the, uh, the the Welsh hordes out? I think so, yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. But anyway, we're in, I think it was real one night. Right. And all the, you know, all the acts were in the same hotel. We tried mm. to grab the best hotel. That's a difficult job it's in It's a difficult real. job in yeah, North yeah. Wales, yeah. But, uh, well, no, no, that'd be... 
Be Although I must say, I mm. stayed in a beautiful hotel outside of Aberystwyth. Oh, yeah, Aberystwyth the, is fine. Uh, the night that... Uh, yeah. Sorry, not... No, Clan Dudno. Clan Dudno, yeah. I, I, I tell a lie. Mm. The mm. night that I had to sort out my news editor and my police oh, right, having a punch-up right. in the curry house. In the curry house together, yeah. yeah. Police and, were involved. Uh, and, and, and then we were in the bar, you know, we'd been finished and got back and people have been out for dinner, come yeah. right in the bar about 10, 10.30. Yeah. And uh, Snowden was sitting there, you know, really plummy mouth. Right. Really walking like, was he know, not staying in a sort of stately home? Well, we, we couldn't quite work out what was going on yeah. and why he was there anyway. He really plummy mouth and all that. So, had he not been, was he not hired by somebody to do the shoot or something? He was doing it for the Sunday Times Colour magazine. Oh, there you you go. know what I mean? And all that kind of stuff. You know, he's going to do his pictures later. He wouldn't do anything like take a picture and have to oh, get no. in a car and dash off to no, Fleet no. Street with a few not. prints or something like no. that, you know. And, um, and, uh, there was about six of us around this table and, you know, people were buying rounds and all that. And then we suddenly noticed after about two and a half hours, at half past one in the morning, yeah. we had an awful lot to drink, but yeah. Snowden hadn't actually But he's actually in your company. Though. He's in the t- he's sitting around yeah. the table. Right. And and so some one of us, it might have been me, I'm not sure, said, uh, oh, yeah, um, you know, Tony. Yeah. You know, give you a glared at you, you yeah. know. But was he one. speaking? I mean, yeah, was he, he was speaking. He, he was offering us pearls of wisdom. Oh, yeah. You know, he thought he was the the, uh, the chief guest oh, in the I room, see. not yeah. a, not a member of the of the press yeah. pack. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So he was sitting there, you know, all you know, looking very royal and yeah. offering you know insights into yeah. life and you know the royal family and of course Diana will be doing this and yeah. that and all that. You know. So after I turned, I said, uh, Tony, you know, it's your round. <laughs> what? I said you haven't. You know, you've had about. Ten large gin and tonics, yeah. you know, must be imitating your wife's intake of uh, of alcohol. I said, but uh, everybody's quite like lubricated yes, by it this I'm time. Sure. But you haven't bought a drink. So get off the bar, and, and and somebody else, like you know, probably Don Mackay, yeah. like, okay, and then your pocket, get off the bar, then get that boys a drink, you know. And he said, I, I, I beg your pardon. I don't carry money. I don't buy drinks. He was, he was he absolutely shocked. Yeah. He was absolutely shocked. Mm. He, he felt that. You know, because he was a member of the royal family, which he was on the edge but of. He'd, but he'd only been adopted as one, hadn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, you know, that he had no place in the world in buying drinks or getting... And literally didn't have any money on him, you Thank know. goodness that seems yeah. to be a thing of the past. Yeah. But I was reading, I think it's part of this book that's just come out. That's right. Uh, a sort of a, 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 a treatise on how yes. Princess Margaret used to start her day. Yep. And it says, 9am, she has breakfast in bed, hmm. followed by two hours in bed listening to the radio, <laughs> reading the newspapers, which she invariably left scattered over the floor, hmm. and chain smoking. Yeah. Uh, 11 a.m. Well, must be repulsive, mustn't it? You know, a bedroom full of Well, smoke. I mean, as a former smoker, yeah. I wouldn't say it's repulsive, yeah. but I would yeah. find it that way now. Yeah. 11 a.m., she gets into a bath, run for her by her lady's maid. Yes. Noon, an hour in the bath, mm. is followed by hair and makeup at the dressing table, mm. and then she puts on clean clothes, and as one would imagine of a princess, she never wore any of her clothes more than once without having them cleaned. Uh, at 12.30 p.m., mm. she appears downstairs for a vodka pick-me-up. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Now, I can't believe that that's the first drink she's had of the, in the day. Well, I can't believe I she's latterly, lying in bed for two hours smoking and not, you know, imbibing. I think, I think latterly, yeah. uh, maybe she started to drink a little bit earlier. Yeah. At 1 p.m., she joins the Queen Mother for a four-course lunch mm. served in an informal manner from silver dishes. That's right. Now, the, right? Now the Queen Mother is also dead, but she was the mother of the current Queen yeah. and Princess Margaret, yeah. and she herself was not unknown mm. to be a bit of a gin fiend. Well, by 1pm, I imagine the Queen Mother would have had quite a lot of gin. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. Uh, the lunch is served, as I say, in silver dishes mm. with half a bottle of wine per person, plus fruit and half a dozen different varieties of native and continental cheeses. Yes, lovely. I mean, if you ever wanted an advert for why you should get rid of the royal family... That's right, that's yeah. It. I, t- I totally agree. So, I mean, but apart that doesn't from... go on about the rest of the day, because then, well, then she has a nap in the afternoon, isn't it? Well, what presumably they make a few calls to the betting shop, because, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were quite yeah. active on the old horse racing front, Yeah, they, they were, yeah. And then you'd get, sort of, um, presumably, a bit more drinking mm. before afternoon tea. Yeah. But, and uh, then you'd have maybe another lie down. That's right. And then get up, uh, put in a different evening. dress on, but, and go and have a few more of the sherbets before dinner. But this book points out things. Like, for instance, when she had a house on Mustique, right? Yeah. She used to invite people over, Mick Jagger and all that. Yeah. But nobody was allowed to go to bed until she wanted to go to bed. Right. And that could be four o'clock in the morning could if be. she was into the yeah. gin. But, you know, it says here, for instance, um, the crowd that Margaret attracted were lick spittle hangers-on, mm. snooty theatre directors, social climbers, and all the cynics who used her as edgy entertainment. The connoisseurs wanted to see her getting uppity. It's what she did best. Besides such laughing sophisticates, the princess herself could even seem an innocent abroad. Yeah, so I'm she... surprised you weren't part of that entourage. Well, so that's the kind of thing you would get involved in. Yeah, well, I, you know... I'm, you know, sort of hanging around with your betters. That's right. Her friend Gore Vidal thought her far too intelligent... Gore Vidal. Vidal, yeah. Gore Vidal thought her far too intelligent for a station in life, 
and her often dismissive remarks about plays that she'd just been dragged to mm. were out of a sense of uh, desperation and uh, might have had something to do with the amount of gin she'd, um, no, she'd ingested be before she went there. Wouldn't be at all surprised. Yeah. Shocking stuff. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, we can get back to the real world now. Talk Radio, we are the two mics. Coming up a little bit later on, we'll be talking about uh, bars around the world. Some of those bars around the world may well be in Barcelona uh, because the Catalan Parliament has voted to declare independence from Spain. Uh, mm. We're going to go over there now uh, and speak to Geordie P, uh, who's a ca- Catalonian journalist, Mr Parry, uh, yes. who's going to tell us exactly what the situation is because I don't think anyone's entirely sure what happens now. Mm. Uh, Geordie, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank yeah. you so Thank much you for joining, for joining us. us. Uh, 70 in favour, 10 against, two uh, abstentions by the looks of it. The Speaker, uh, Carme Forcadell, uh, read out the resolution to say that uh, mm. Catalonia is now an independent state. But is it? Uh, well, uh, by, by the, the Catalan law they just passed, it is. Uh, now uh, Catalonia is, is uh, an independent uh, state. Uh, we'll see what what happens next with with Spain. We'll see what the, the Spanish uh, reaction. If it's more, well, it it will uh, supposedly be. Oh, we just lost just Jordi. Lost him, yeah. I mean, what presumably but, is going to happen next yeah. is that the, the is the Spanish uh, Parliament in Madrid mm. is going to say, "Well, I'm sorry, Hello? we don't recognise this vote." Yeah, hi, hi, Jordi. We got you back. Yeah, go on, please finish. Uh, no, as I was saying, uh, we don't know what will what will happen next, but uh, we suppose that uh, Spain will will continue with uh, repression they, they they did on the October the first when when it was the voting. They passed uh, today also uh, in the Spanish Senate the the art the application of the Article 155 on the mm-hmm. Spanish Constitution, mm-hmm. which says that in case. Uh, 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 an autonomy, uh, a region of of Spain. If a, a regional government mm. uh, surpasses the law, the Spanish law, then the central government takes control of that of that region. So now there's there's the the, the political conflict here between the the two localities, the Catalan legality that has just declared independence in in the Catalan Parliament by 70 uh, votes mm. against the this Spanish legality that says uh, that the, the Spanish government will, from tomorrow, when this, this law that has been passed will be published, mm. uh, that the Spanish government will take the, the role uh, that now has the, the Catalan one. OK, so what do you think will happen next, Geordie? Will the Spanish government now have to start thinking about mobilising troops if, uh, if this is going to stick? That's what uh, lots of people fear here in 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 Catalonia, Barcelona. That yeah, we saw the we all all Europe, all the world saw the the repression that happened on the October the first when it was only people voting. Yep. Now that the independence has been has been officially declared uh, uh, by the by the Catalan Parliament, uh, nobody knows that uh, people uh, fear that. It will be the the army that goes uh, against mm. the the Catalan not only institutions but uh, some people fear that maybe uh, even a more more repressive. Uh, sure, uh, you, because the, because you the Madrid government previously did not recognise the referendum, right? They basically said that was course, illegal. Uh, they, so presumably they, they won't recognise the the referendum. It was illegal uh, mm. according to to, the, to mm. let's say Spanish uh, law. Mm. Uh, so they did not recognize uh, the result, even though they did all they could to to stop it. Uh, and now, uh, yeah, uh, they will also uh, not recognize, of course, this no. this uh, vote that has been just in, held uh, in in the Catalan Parliament just mm. ten minutes ago. And uh, we we will have to let the, the expression wait wait and see what happens, but. Uh, we, we we can say that uh, it will be again a more more replash, more repression and uh, less less politics. Hmm. Okay, indeed. Jordi, thank you very indeed. much thank indeed very for much bringing indeed. us that. Uh, the latest news is that uh, indeed Catalonia has declared itself independent mm. uh, from Spain. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Marta Maligon here, who is a producer here at Talk Radio yes. from Barcelona. Hello. You've been there recently. Very mm. good afternoon. Thanks for coming in. Mm. Um, this is a, an extraordinary development, but does it mean anything at all? 
You know, Mike, that's a very good question. I'm not sure yeah. because mm. uh, I've just heard the news. I was I was downstairs in the basement producing another show. My mom texted me like, oh, my God, we've yeah. done it. Yeah. So uh, the parliament has voted to declare independence, but am I right in saying that the Catalan prime first minister has not announced it officially yet? No, he hasn't, no. Well, well the parliament has, has, has voted 70 to 10, basically, yeah, to, if, to if pass the, it. If the Scottish parliament mm. suddenly just announced, oh, we've just had a vote yeah. inside and we're going to um, secede ourselves yeah, from Great nothing. Britain. Yeah, means we're, means yeah we're, we're moving out of Great Britain. It, it, it's just a gesture, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, I, I would be expecting an announcement soon. Mm. And I think mm. when that happens, uh, well, I think Madrid has already reacted and they're saying, no, direct rule is going to be imposed. This right. is not going ahead. This right. is not going to happen. I think, uh, as my colleague Jordi was saying, there's going to be loads of repression. I think uh, Carles Puigdemont, the first minister of Catalonia, he's going to be in prison tonight really? because he's been threatened with... And then, see, that's oh, really? the kind of thing that leads to a, to a war situation. Cart him away. Exactly, mm. yeah. exactly. Because, mm. you know, it all started with the referendum that you mm. were guys saying it was declared illegal right, by yeah. the Spanish government. And, you know, the Spanish yeah. government could have just but, said... But, but, Marta, but, let's get this into perspective, because although this is a declaration, it's the Catalonia's Parliament have voted to declare independence, so, oh, we're, we're independent, but there are quite a lot of people in that region who don't want independence, aren't there? Yeah. So, so not is it only going to mm. be if, if the Spanish government move the army in, mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot of people in that region saying, what on earth are you up to? We want to stay in Spain. It's not clear cut, is it? Exactly, no. absolutely. And that's why, in my opinion, there needs to be a referendum because now the Catalan well, side... Referendum. Well, yeah, but, but it wasn't but a proper referendum. It, it no, wasn't it, a proper yeah, one, yeah, so I see what you mean, yeah. uh, mainly... An, a most, referendum accepted by everybody in the country. Exactly, because uh, what happened in this last one that we had was that the majority of people who went to vote went to vote for independence, yeah. Yeah. and the people who did not want independence, they were like, well, bother voting. it's not legal. Exactly. So I think, because uh, the Catalans and the pro-independence side, they're saying... Well, there's two million people in the streets that want to become independent. Yeah. Mm. What about the other five million people? Sure. Exactly, yeah. But so, if... so do you suspect that actually there are more people who don't want independence? Then is that what you're saying? Oh, absolutely. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Because what's being said as well is the Catalan Parliament has voted in favour of beginning what they're calling a constituent process, mm. which yes. would mean mm. that it could be a long process. So you can't go around declaring independence no. before you start to say, well, surely we're going to start the process. Yeah. So they can't really say it. They can't. No, I think, and it's. It's all a shambles. I've got to say that personally, I am pro independence, but mm. the way they're doing it, it's yeah. just it's just ridiculous. It's, it's like in this country. It's amateur, pe- isn't it? Uh, yeah, people in Cornwall yeah. say, we want to be our own country. Right. It's like the Cornwall County and they Council. They go, we got a flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. We got a flag. Cornwall County Council get together. And we're declaring independence yeah. from Great Britain. We don't know where we're going to get our money from or our mm. taxes or anything like that. But you're absolutely right. What's got to happen is somebody in Madrid has got to set up a proper referendum which involves yes. everybody in the region we're talking about, not just those who went and voted because they wanted to be separate. Exactly, and which also involves the Spanish government mm. campaigning for people to vote to stay because yes. in this last referendum we only had one side campaigning and, mm. you know, That's it's right, really yeah. easy to so say. Like but also, Cameron Spain have got to, we haven't got any time here, but Spain have got to be very careful not to overreact too yes. because if they start locking people up That's and sending problem. in the rubber bullet brigade, mm. Mm. then suddenly everybody else is going to get involved. The yeah. EU is going to have to get involved and yeah. it will be a real mess. Well, That's exactly. Right. Like two weeks ago, in the, within the last two weeks, sorry, we've had loads of demonstrations because they've locked two guys up who mm. are leaders of civilian societies. They're not politicians. Yeah. They've not done anything wrong besides... Uh, getting people to go to the streets mm, to sure. shout and say they're not uh, agree with Madrid, mm. Madrid. And they're in prison at the moment yes, because pr- of their ideas. But and that's ridiculous. That that takes so, us back yeah. to Franco it, it times. Does. Exactly. Just... Pursuing proper democracy can solve this problem, can't it? Because if everybody is who's involved is allowed to express exactly. their opinion, exactly. and half of them haven't so far, that should solve the problem, shouldn't it? I yeah. think, in and my then... opinion, it will solve it. Because also... It would work so well for Madrid. And again, I'm mm. on the other side. I want independence. Yeah. But if Madrid were intelligent enough to campaign for Catalonia to stay, yeah. a majority of people yeah. would vote to stay. And you could put that question to sleep for one, yeah. maybe two mm. generations. Exactly. I mean, it's a bit like David um, Cameron in this country decided yes. to put his weight behind a Remain uh, programme, but lost. Then mm. that's what the Spanish are going to do. But you think they'll win? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. right. Mm. Okay, well, we'll be following it with great interest. Master, yes, thank indeed. you very much thank indeed. You very much we indeed. are unfortunately out of time, but we'll bring you up to date with anything that happens. Madrid will have to respond, and I presume they'll respond before the end of this show, mm. as you talk radio.
This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. The Porky Quiz coming up in the next hour, and we're going to talk movies as well. Right now, though, uh, one of our favourite subjects is about to be uh, yep. uh, discussed, and that is, of course, drinking. Where to drink, what to drink on every continent. I think I've drunk on most continents. You've probably been drunk on most continents, Mr. Parry. I think I uh, probably a book have. called Straight Up, just out, with Neil Ridley and Joel Harrison. And Neil has joined us uh, in the studios. Neil, a very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Delighted yeah, to hi, see Neil. you at 2.48 in the afternoon, completely sober as a judge. Absolutely. Well, yes, it's a, it's a dirty Man job, of style. It? Uh, it's a dirty job, but it's a great book, though, I have to say. I mean, I'm happy to say that I know quite a lot of the bars that you've, that you've highlighted in here. Um, but more than 550 bars covered um, in a book which presumably took you at least a year or so more uh, to put together. Yeah, I mean, the process of researching something like this, um, I think we had an idea how long that might take in mind. And then, of course, you sort of double that. Yes. After you, when you visit a great city and you start exploring it in real detail and basing it on sort of your friends and your peers and the sort of recommendations of others, suddenly a whole world yeah. opens up, really. Mm. And that's, I, the process was about two years, really. Of okay. How, how did you not become an alcoholic? Because if you're writing a book about bars and doing the research thoroughly... Yes. Oh, drinking very responsibly, you see. That's a thing. Well, we I, call that bladderation in moderation. Yes, we do. Yeah, something like yes. that. Because yes. I'm assuming if you go to somewhere like Singapore or New York City or Hong Kong, I mean, mm. you have to have a pretty sort of... Um, um, well-disciplined timetable, but you'd probably still have to do about four or five bars in a day, wouldn't you? Well, that was that was one of the things. Actually, funny enough, Singapore was a very good example of that, where I visited uh, about uh, five to six months ago. And having not known the city before, of mm. course, you're presented with this sort of amazing vista of, of, of food and drink culture. And heat. And heat, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, there, you're absolutely right. You have to sort of establish mm. where you're going to go and mm. use your time efficiently. And so, yeah, I, I must confess, sort of, yeah, four or five bars a night uh, mm. after five days. What did, did you drink in each one? Yes. What did you drink in each one? Um, try and drink locally, really. So there was a great bar in Singapore, uh, quite a new one called Native, mm. and all the drinks that they were using, uh, that they were serving, used um, spirits and wines and uh, ingredients from Southeast Asia, really. Right. So mm. they tried to go as local as they could. One of the drinks included uh, a handful of freeze dried ants as well. So, yeah. I mean, uh, almost. <laughs> Freeze dry dance. You would love that. Oh, wouldn't you? no. Doesn't our friend Alan Brazil, a uh, colleague on TalkSport, hold the record for in raffles bar for yeah, the, does. drinking the most Singapore gin sling? <laughs> Singapore sling. Which slings, I think yeah. is about 53. Mm. Sadly, it was quite closed to you when I visited. Oh, really? Yeah, raffles, yeah. yeah. To be honest, it's a bit of a gimmick, actually, raffles. Tiger bar. under the snooker the table. Tiger under the table mm. and all the monkey nuts uh, mm. shells on the mm. floor and all that kind of thing. New York, obviously, a fascinating place for us. We both worked there uh, a few years ago. And in fact, um, visited recently. And visited recently to a show there. We, I mean, it, it's, it's changed a lot over the years, but it's good to hear that there's still a few bars there that haven't changed over. I see you've got one in Irving Place, where I used to drink, actually, sure. um, and uh, still there, still going strong, you know, still very much old New York. Well, that's it. I think New York, again, as a sort of city, you'd expect it to, to have one of the world's best bar scenes, and I think even then some... It goes an extra mile, if you like, to really start to drive home why it is one of the best places to go drinking around the world. I mean, everywhere from, uh, you'd say, the Dead Rabbit, which is a, I'm now a very famous bar, uh, wins uh, endless numbers of awards around the world. Uh, for its style and quality and, and sheer ingenuity. And then all the way over to somewhere like McSorley's Old Ale House, yeah. which I think is probably one of the oldest pubs in New York. And you walk in and it hasn't changed for, I mean, decades. Has it still only got one toilet? One toilet, yeah. yeah you, you go and order a beer and you get two. Right. Um, mm. you know, bizarrely enough, brilliantly enough. Um, and in those funny mugs that they have in America, right, which are neither a pint nor a half pint, they're right. sort of somewhere in between. Yeah, it's hard to gauge how much you're drinking. Yeah, really. well, you just keep drinking. Now, I'm delighted to say one of the cities you've... Uh, listen to the book is Reykjavik one yes. of my favourite places in the world did you get there? My colleague Joel went to Reykjavik and what um, time of the year would he have gone? Uh, I think it was fairly yeah autumn time right so okay because it's better of, in the cold uh, Reykjavik yeah I mean it's, yeah. it's perpetually cold I believe but, that's, that, that's right does yeah. it ever get warm? Not really. In it gets a bit warmer in the in the summer, but not really. But mm. there's some great bars there, and actually, a lot of uh, sort of European musicians went off to Reykjavik and started buying bars. Um, who was the one I'm thinking about? Do you know, the, the Damon album. From yeah, that's right. Yeah. It was. It yeah, was him. That's right. that's right. Yeah, and I went to his bar, and uh, and it's splendid. And I suppose because the Icelandic people are very good-looking people. 
uh, it helps, you know what I mean? It's a bit of a generalisation. Well, no, no, there's a certain class about uh, Reykjavik and the people who... who uh, Bjork is from sports. Iceland, isn't she? Sorry? Isn't Bjork from Iceland? Bjork is from Iceland as well, yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. There's yeah. a certain refinement there, isn't it? And I mean, there certainly is now with the drinking culture there. There's yes. a great uh, a bar in a hotel, actually, where they're starting to mix all this ingenuity together into mm. different drinks. One of them stirred with an electric drill. And you're yeah. starting to think, OK, so this could be gimmicky. Actually, you try the drink. Stirred with an electric yeah. drill. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, mm. Uh, See, that's interesting as well, because you've got a lot of hotel bars in this book and I mean I'm one of those people I mean we'd been, when we used to do a lot of running around the world as, as Fleet Street reporters and yeah. journalists you'd find yourself in a lot of hotel bars but I'm not a big fan generally now no. of going to a hotel bar unless you're meeting somebody who's staying there or something I mean like you've got the American bar in the Savoy in here you've got the Connaught you've got uh, the bar at Claridge's in mm. London um, you know all wonderful places to visit but are there I mean do you really get sort of treated well and do you get value for money I'm not sure you do well good example actually um, for Last night, actually, was it night before? No, yes, l- l- the night before last, I was uh, in the Connaught Bar, right. which I would consider to be unquestionably one of the finest bars I've ever been to. Right. Um, the level of service that you get, the again, the sort of style of the drinks, mostly a classic style drink. So you're looking at martinis, yeah. Manhattans, mm. Negronis, these kind of older style drinks. But what you're getting. Sure, certainly they are uh, you're paying a premium for this but at the same time what you really are getting is a genuine experience yeah. you're so paying it, what about 20 quid a drink though, yeah somewhere up, up around that amount but with the, the Connaught for instance you'll have a trolley which uh, is brought over to your table you can have different infusions of bitters that go into it the martini's poured at length and you get this wonderful sort of aeration in the drink and it is a genuine experience to go mm. and see a drink ma- being mm. made this way you yeah. were saying to me the other day were you not that there's uh, some surveys come out that says yes. if you want to drink a cocktail and enjoy Enjoy it more. That's right. You're doing a long, a long glass. glass. Yeah, that was uh, that was actually a report that we saw, and that cocktails in short glasses don't taste the same because you don't need too much air in your cocktail. Well, good thing that there's a whole technique now called throwing, which apparently right. dates back to sort of. Um, I think China throwing different teas, so you know, mm-hmm. aerate your tea by sort of mixing it at great height through these uh, right cups. Yep. Bartenders are now starting to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so a cocktail shaker becomes um, a very well, well, under, why, why underpowered co- fa- facility. Yeah, then. why cocktails do taste better in tall glasses? Cocktails are more satisfying when drunk from a tall, slender glass than a squat one because we're tricked into thinking it holds more than uh, it really does. And that gives our taste buds an added burst. Good old-fashioned marketing. Eh? Yes, oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cocktails came in a six-inch high-ball-style glass. Do you like a high-ball-style glass? Yes, yeah. indeed. In fact, great drink there, the highball. If you go out to Tokyo, uh, mm-hmm. one of the classic drinks that you'd have is Japanese whiskey over amazing clear ice in a highball glass, mm. uh, either a highball with soda water or called a miswari with uh, a still water. And it's stirred beautifully. I mean, essentially, it's a whiskey and, and, and water or yeah. soda. Um, I've never tasted anything as refined and as clear and as elegant as some of the bars that we visited wow. uh, in Tokyo to have this really? very simple drink. Yeah, well, un- And culturally speaking, you've obviously been to so many different parts of the world. I mean, what was Russia like, for example? Because Russia is going to be a place that we might go to oh, uh, yeah. next year. I like Russia. Um, you've I been like there Russian many bars. Times, but yeah. What about Russian Big bars? Big emerging scene. I mean, I think probably starting now to gain a lot more traction uh, within the bar community around the world. I think it's fascinating because there are lots of these places where, of course, there are going to be one or two great, very revered Mm. bars um, of old. And I think now what's happening, because you've got an international community coming together, you're starting to see a lot more transition of people going over and working in new places, trying out and bringing new scenes. Almost everything in Russia is based on vodka. Banana vodka, cherry vodka, you name it. I mean, and they and by the way, the the thing that most surprised me the first time I was there is they drink vodka out of wine glasses as though it's wine in the mm. same quantities. Ah, it's making a big comeback now. Vodka. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, it I, I, I bet it is. Um, I haven't read the, the the whole book, mate. But um, did you get to Dublin? And are there any locations there? Yes, indeed. Um, um one of our favourite cities actually. There's a great yes. bar called Peruk and Periwig. Now, um, quite new actually. That uh, in, in the book there are featured interviews with different bartenders or star tenders as we call them, and uh, there's a guy Aaron Hayden who uh, is the head bartender at this place, Peru and Periwig. Brilliantly. Do you know which of, street that's in? Uh, I'd have to look at the around Phoenix. Uh... Well, everything in yeah, Dublin yeah, is sure. about ten minutes walk. That's right, it is, yeah, it is, yeah. Fortunate, but uh, you've got some classic Grafton there. You've Street, got, probably around Grafton. Mm. Yeah, you've got mm. Bose. You've got the new, actually, the new Jameson Distillery um, building now has a great cocktail bar in it as well. Oh, so right. You've got some terrific pubs. Then, obviously, now more sort of sophisticated mm. cocktail scene. Yeah. Dublin, great place to go drinking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Are absolutely. we ever going to get to the point in England? And I always have this as a bugbear whenever I speak to anybody about bars, where the bar service is as good as it is in Manhattan, because I lived in New York for a long time. 
went back there well, just recently. Professional barman, and, of course. Yeah, of course. But what I'm saying is, is that no matter how good a bar is in London, it's still not quite there for me. I think that's a very good question. And actually, I'd, I'd refer back to what I just said, actually, how you've now got people moving cities and continents. Mm. Uh, long, long, long time ago, you had, um, uh, back to the sort of 20s, you had Harry Craddock, who was a very famous bartender, uh, went out to America, came back to uh, the Savoy and sort of effectively started the idea of the American bar scene yeah. in London and bringing all these techniques and flavours and, and style of drinks over. I think what we're starting to see a bit more now are bartenders travelling around and you're tending to find some of that New York style service coming over here. I mean, for me, the Tokyo bartending service is probably the best I've ever experienced. Really? So, yeah, and, mm. and you, you have people spending 10, 15, 20 years as an assistant at a bar mm. until they dare even think about sort of venturing out and opening their own place. So right. it's, it's yeah. a genuine profession, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah it is, very well, much Well, Neil, so. listen, thank you very much for coming mm. in. We're out of time, unfortunately, mm. and we can't even go drinking with you because we've got to do another hour of the what show. What a great shame. Much, yes, uh, we'll absolutely. have to do that another time, though. It's Neil we Ridley will. and Joel Harrison's book. It's called Straight Up, more than 550 bars around the world. If you want to go... The uh, Two uh, Mites on Talk great, Radio. Yeah. We'll get you talking. This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics coming up a little bit later on in the show. Aldo Zilli is going to be joining yeah, us to that's talk great. to us about many things, including probably mm, uh, yeah. the introduction of pigs' heads to that's the right. new sort of uh, trendy way of eating dinner. Absolutely uh, vaults Also, uh, fantastic to have Neil Ridley uh, on the show earlier on. It I just was. wanted to point out mm. that in, in amongst all of the various places that, that he visits, right, yes. uh, he got, he, he's got Gordon's Wine Bar down here. You know Gordon's Wine Bar, which is down by the bottom of um, Embankment Station? Oh, yes, just I do. Come yeah, out yeah. Of Embankment I Station. It's a very yeah. old sort of underneath the eye. Archie's that's right. type place. It, it is, drips yeah. with, with water sometimes. Yes, that's right, yeah. It's got all these old candles which are absolutely yes. sort of covered in old ca- old candle wax. Yes. It's a very dark and gloomy place, but quite mm. a romantic place, mm. uh, I have to tell you, um, where yeah. I once sat and was uh, was uh, propositioned by a Frenchman. Uh, uh, you were propositioned? I was, yeah. I was with the mother of my children. Right. And uh, she went off to get another drink or something. Yeah. And this guy who was on the next table, yes. who was French, Said, turned to me and said, yeah. excuse me, mm. may I talk to you? I said, yes, by all means. Mm-hmm. He said, you have very beautiful lips. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, thank you very much. Very mm. kind. Mm. And he said, may I kiss you? Mm. And I said, well... Um, was this guy, like, heavily intoxicated? He or was, was he I would say gay? he was a little bit, uh, he was a little bit um, mm. merry, I would mm. say. Yeah. I don't think he was gay. He just wanted to kiss me. Oh, and I said, I said, he was, well, he's French. I said, well, as long as you kiss me on the cheek, that's yeah. fine. So he kissed me on the cheek. I don't think I'd have allowed that to happen. Why not? If it had been me. Why? I just, well, I just wouldn't. I, I would have felt very uncomfortable. It was a very pleasant moment, actually, because it was one of yeah. those, you know, okay. brothers in arms type moments. Okay. It didn't feel at all sexual. Well, it's I think... It's making you uncomfortable, this conversation. Uh, no, it's not making... I think it is. No, it's not making me uncomfortable. I think it it's is. It's not making me uncomfortable, but mm. uh, I would not have been able to respond as you did. I no. would have uh, well, that's you're a bit told uptight. him to uh, get off, you so, know, and do one. Yeah, well, um, in French, obviously. Uh, now, let me tell you something else about the uh, the drinking fraternity. Yes. Because I should announce that mm. the Buckinghamshire pub, uh, which is known as the Pointer, yes. has been named Pub of the Year mm. 2018 by the Michelin Eating Out in Pubs Guide. Right. right. And it's been given a Michelin star, and it's the place where mm. apparently the great train robbers planned the great train robbery. Uh, Slade Farm was nearby. Yeah. Slade Farm was where they hold up with the dosh. Yes. And, uh, it's a place called Brill, Brill in yeah. Buckinghamshire, yeah. which you should live in, really, because you say Brill quite a lot. Well, I do say Brill or Brillo, yeah. yeah. And uh, if they'd have um, tidied up Slade Farm a bit better, mm. they probably would never have been caught, but they left so many clues there that right. it was easy for the police. Slade Farm was a, a farm they rented, right? Yeah. And uh, took all the money back, counted all the money out, but they left things like the wrappers around the five pound notes yeah. uh, littered all over the floor. Oh dear! And, and apparently, this yeah. pub they actually went back to mm. after the robbery, yeah. and presumably after they'd been back to Slade Farm mm. uh, to, 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 to dole out the dosh, mm. and went back and had more drinks there after the event. Yeah, that's which uh, is amazing, isn't it? Well, a bit of a strange way to celebrate to suddenly go out in public and people who formerly didn't have any money, yeah. suddenly throwing the money well, around in drinks. I don't know if that's what they did, but well, I mean, they were there beforehand as well. But yeah. the, the people who yeah. own the place. Now they've mm. also got a two hundred forty acre farm where they raise award winning rare breed cattle and pigs. I think we should go to this place for lunch. Yeah, well, sounds maybe. ideal. Sounds very good indeed. Yeah, you know, the other day we were talking about pub names, weren't we? And we, we were. never got round to explaining most of them. No, but, um, you know things. Are like, you going to do that now? Well, could do, but I mean things like the three horseshoes, the coach and horses. They've all got historical names. Yes. It? The bell in the early days of the railways, a bell was rung at the station to tell people a train was about to depart, right. which is why you'll often find a pub called the Bell nearby. Okay, because you went into the hostelry next door, yes. but then you heard the clanging of the bell on the station the yeah, trains right. coming you know right 
I mean, quite often train train station pubs are yeah. called after the station, aren't they? Yeah, well, they're called the railway. Yeah, um, that's the railway is. Hang on, the railway in is about the tenth or twelfth most popular name for a pub. The railway tavern, the tenth most popular name for a pub in this country. Yeah, and there's a railway tavern. The one I know best is in. A place called Car Sholton. I know Car Sholton. Uh, next to the, it's next to the station. It's uh-huh. called the Railway Inn. Okay, the Railway Tavern. But the most popular name is the Crown, isn't it? Is that what the we Crown discovered? is the most no Red Line. Oh, the Red the Line. The Line was part of the coat of arms of John of Gaunt, which we hmm. explained. The Crown is the second most popular. During the English Civil War, many pubs showed their support for the monarchy by calling themselves the Crown. And the third most popular, the Royal Oak. The name commemorates the tree in which the future King Charles II hid to escape from Oliver Cromwell's Roundhead forces yeah. after his defeat at Worcester in no, 1651. Now, say the Royal Oak, because weren't you going to tell me some story about acorns becoming very, very voluminous uh, yeah, over the course of the last uh, sort of 12 months or so? Acorns terribly voluminous, yeah. all over the floor at the moment. Mm. And, I have noticed, uh, actually, when I go on my yeah. walks with the dog, yes. uh, that there are more acorns visible on the ground than normal. I think you've got to be a bit careful with dogs, because aren't acorns poisonous to dogs? I think they are. Yeah, But yeah. luckily, for most things that are poisonous mm. to dogs, Dogs yeah. kind of stay away from them. Like, for example, yes. if you drop food on the floor, oh, yes. he will absolutely lap it up and, and yeah, go yeah. for it. But if it's an onion, yeah. which is supposed to be bad for dogs, they yeah. don't go near him. Yeah, well, he would eat raw onion. Not even a dog would eat raw well, onion. I eat raw onion. Oh, do you? Yeah, well, I suppose. Well, have you never had a hamburger with a raw onion on it? Uh, no, I have a hamburger with um, fried onions on it, which is great. Well, that's what you get from a, one of those horrible sort of yeah, street vendors. dog burger vans. Yeah, which I, which I those like. Those things you should not eat. Yeah, well, it's I... probably not even meat. Uh, listen, don't worry about it. Uh, anyway, the last, uh, let me see here. Uh, it's a mast year, okay? A what? A mast year. What does that mean? They're, they're talking about trees now. They have mast years, okay? Yeah, well, as, as in like ship mast, that kind of thing. Uh, well, it's just called the mast year because sometimes uh, what happens when a mast year comes round, far more acorns fall than wildlife can possibly consume. Uh-huh. This gives the trees a better chance of creating oak saplings the following spring. And it's Mother's Nature's way of rigging the odds. Uh-huh. We already know that in the Appalachian Mountains of the United States, yes. oaks are moving what looks like an epic mass year. But oak species vary around the world, uh, as does the climate. But we're having an as- a mass year now in Britain, and there are millions and millions of acorns around, yeah. which is great for the, acor- for the uh, population of those trees that produce them, yeah. the oak tree. Because presumably, um, just by the power of, of numbers, yes. more oak trees will grow from yes, more that's right. acorns. That's right. Mm. The word mast is used for the fruit of oak, beech, chestnut, and other woodland trees. Oh, yeah. And for reasons scientists still don't fully understand... Our oaks do not produce uniform numbers of nuts each year. Some years are boom years, but they only come back every 13 years, and this is one of them. Oh, OK. So that's great, isn't so, it? So, I mean, we don't have to do anything. It's not like a call to arms. No, no. Have to sort of scoop up the acorns no, no. and put them in the ground somewhere where they can grow into a tree. No, what it means is, what it means is, apparently, is uh, when, the, when the acorns come off the trees, mm. then you're leaving, like, an open connection uh-huh. which then flowers and makes the oak trees stronger i see so the more the more oak the more acorns they can shed yeah then the more of them the more of the tree is available then to uh rebirth itself you oh, see I what see. i mean yeah, yeah. The, how do the acorns grow into the oak trees though Oh, well, that's, uh, you know, an acorn into an oak tree doth grow is like a Macbethian type uh, Macbethian. quote. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Like a Shakespearean, Shakespearean type yeah. thing. Well, and isn't it from small, from tiny acorns, mighty oaks will grow? Well, that's right, yeah. Isn't but, of, the, but of course, quote? that would take 200 years. So they, the acorns that fall off the trees don't grow new trees right. because there wouldn't be enough room for their roots. I see. What they do is they free up the what you might call the... You know the the blood veins uh-huh. of the trees. I see. Uh, to, I'm not convinced to open up to the atmosphere. Well, I am. I think I you am. need to do more research. On and this by the way, looking at uh, Neil's book, who yeah. came in to see us uh, just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Terrific book, as mm. you quite rightly said. It's called. Have you put a picture of it out? Uh, I haven't yet. No, yeah, we're going to put a picture of it out. Yeah. Neil Ridley's book. Well, maybe I'll up. put a picture of you holding it. How about that? Yes, that's a good idea. And they've actually cited on a place I use occasionally when I'm up there, the Smugglers Cove in Liverpool. Oh yeah. It's uh, it's in the Britannia Pavilion, and you must have heard me mention the Al- not the Britannia Hotel. No, 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 it's not, no. But you've heard me mention the Apple, the, uh, the uh, sorry, the Albert Dock. I have. Well, it's in the Albert Dock. Well, I've stayed there with you. Yeah, you have stayed did there. Did we not you? stay in a hotel there? Yeah, once. we did, yeah. The um, the uh, something plus, what was it called? It's a Holiday Inn type. Crown no, Plaza. The Crown, Crown Plaza. Plaza, that's the one, yeah. 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 No, the Head- Adelphi is where we stayed the last time. Oh, the Adelphi's rubbish. And by the way, I saw a report on the worst hotels in this country. It's the Britannia Group. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether the Adelphi is part of the is. Britannia Group, yeah. is it? Yeah, I think it, it is, is. Yeah. tragically. But it says here, head to the recently refurbished Albert Docks in Liverpool and you might think you've entered the set of Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, yeah. Especially when you swing through the doors of the Smuggler's Cove, one of Liverpool's newest and most exciting bars. It's not a pirate-themed bar, but it certainly takes its influence from the era of tall ships 
export on the high seas, and of course, rum. The bar itself is cavernous, mirrors extensive rum list. Yeah. Uh, See, I'm not keen on, on sort of themed bars. As no, I'm not really. But but if I show you a picture of it, it's yeah. actually themed. It just looks like the sort of place you'd walked into in 17th century Liverpool. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd a like Smuggler's that. Cove bar. Yeah. Oh, I would. I'd love it. I'm going to go there next time uh, I'm off. Yeah. like Trader Vic's that used to be in the basement of the Hilton. Yeah, remember? I remember that. Yeah. Which was all about sort of Hawaiian punch and all I that kind of thing. I couldn't stand it. And I thought it was horrible. I used to take young ladies there. Why'd and, you go uh, there then? Well, because it's because it was called it was, Trader Vic's no, and because it's in the Hilton. Show off that you had a load of money. Uh, well, that's and why you went there. Every lady I took there said how tacky it was. Yeah. You know, and they. It's, really, it's, it's, of, it's the sort of place you would love. Yeah, that. instead of being impressed, you know, yeah. with the Polynesian decor, yeah. they just said, "What is this? A theme bar? Yeah, is it? yeah tacky." Yeah. It's usually full of uh, the wrong kind of uh, ladies of the night. As yeah, well. yeah. But that's another story. Mm. Uh, we have got more coming up, including Brian Vine, the Daily Mail film critic, is going to join us. Porky quiz time, and of course, uh, Aldo Zilli. Uh, the celebrity chef is going to be on as well. Indeed. Talk radio. We'll get you talking. I'm going slightly mad. I'm going slightly mad. It finally this is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a lot later, of course. We're back later on tonight. We should remind people on Talk Sport from 10 o'clock. Yes. Uh, and then we're back on t- Talk Sport tomorrow from 10, 11 o'clock. We are. And then we're back on Talk Sport again uh, on Sunday from 10 o'clock. We are. And then we're back here on Tuesday. Next Tuesday. From 1 o'clock. We are. Which is Halloween. That's right. So it's, we've got lots uh, to do. It's a right old seesaw here on Talk Sport Talk Radio. It is. Mm. Life on the ocean waves. Yes. It could never be more fun. No. And who better to talk to about life on the ocean waves than Brian Viner, Absolutely. who is, of course, our very good friend, Daily Mail film critic, yep. uh, a man who has been on our show many times. That's right. And has still yet to uh, have a row with us. And and, and Brian and I, of course, <laughs> still still share the, the grief the of grief developments at Everton. But we'll talk about that later. Yes, indeed. Mm. Brian, very, very good afternoon. Thank you for coming on again. Hi, Hi, Brian. It was my pleasure. Yeah. I was absolutely shocked and stunned, and, and I know that uh, as a as a film man, you, you won't be by this, but I took my kids out last night to watch the new Thor movie, right? And yeah. much to my horror, I was charged £35.50 for me and two I think kids. that's all right. I don't know, £35.50 is a lot of what? money to go and see a film. Well, Brian, you probably did last paid for a, a cinema ticket when you were about 10, did you? <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, um, it's a while. It has been a while, yeah, yeah. But I am aware that it's uh, it's an expensive thing to do. It's no, because, I mean, even they said, you know, we could have uh, waited for this to come out on, uh, you know, Amazon pay-per-view or, or Netflix pay-per-view or whatever it is, and you can pay 10 quid and invite a load of people around to watch it. I know it's not the same as a cinema, but is it any wonder that cinemas are struggling? Because a lot of people can't afford that. Uh, no, that's true. I mean, you know, they, they have to... They have to deliver comfort, and they, you know, they don't always, do they? And they have to, you know. And you, but on the other hand, you know, if you put it, if you compare the price of a coffee, mm. you know, no, no, nobody, you know, I always say this about newspapers. People quibble about the price of newspapers, yeah. but you know, n- nobody actually bats an eyelid at paying two pounds of ninety-five no. for a cup of coffee. No, yeah. absolutely um, right. And I mean, my colleague here, Mr. Parry, mm. was having to go at me saying, "Well, you don't think anything of paying fifty or seventy quid for a bottle of champagne right. in a bar." That's well, not that's the point. Yeah. That's not the point. This is yeah. meant to be a sort of cheap night well, out with the kids. Well, it's, and he, it's he, no longer that. He's having a whinge here, Brian, so don't take any notice. And uh, by the way, I usually pay more than that for my bucket of sweets because I, uh, I love the old sweets in the, uh, in yeah, the cinema. Yeah, look what's happened to you. Yeah, well, that's true. Now, Brian, uh, yeah. one of the reasons we've asked you to join us today is I cannot stand sentimental, slushy films. And, and I read the reviews. Um, everybody's giving Breathe five stars. But it's actually, yeah. it, it's actually quite a sad tale, isn't it? Oh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very well. It's a sad, but at the same time, very uplifting tale. It's a, it's a really, really lovely film. I mean, I, I, um, I went with slight, you know, the, the sort of professional cynicism, you know, that you have, mm. and you think, oh, it's going to be very manipulative and all the rest of it. But it's a, it's a true story. Um, What's it about? It's about a couple who seem to have the world absolutely at their feet. They're a very sort of upper class, good looking. Mm. Uh, a couple in their 20s, and in 1958, I think, they got married, mm. uh, and they went to live in Kenya, where he worked as a tea broker. Their names were Robin and Diana Cavendish, mm. um, played in the movie by Andrew Garfield and Claire Foy. Now, um, shortly and then she got pregnant, and, you know, everything was going right for them, but then he contracted polio mm. and was, for the rest of his life, paralysed from the neck down, and they came back to England and... It's really the story of them and how they surmounted the, the terrible challenges. Um, but it's done in such a lovely way. It's so well directed and beautifully acted that uh, I have to say that I sat in the, the back row of the, the screening room 
with tears running down my face. Oh, no. You that. see, this is past me the sick bag, Alice, time for me. You, know, you know have what you no compassion for well, your fellow well, man. Well, I have, but I mean, you know... You I, don't at all. I, I don't think we have time in modern life to dwell on these things, you know, with such sentiment, to be honest, but I mean... Well, you know, you could, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just that, you know, there are these films, you can go and see Weepies, which try so hard to get you blubbing. Yeah. That you just, that you, you know, that that is time to pass the sick bag, Alice. You know, but... Mm. But this this doesn't seem to it's not it's not manipulative. It just tells the story. It's a true story, mm. um, and and also it's a very inspiring story because this fella was at a time when polio victims were hospital ridden. You know, yeah. there was no way that they could they could go home. But they he, lived in iron lungs, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. They, yeah. they they just lay immobile in hospitals. But this fella. You know, he didn't want to do it. He wanted to die at first, but then, you know, they, they worked out a way of getting him home. Mm. And then he worked out a way, with the help of a, an inventor friend, played in the film by Hugh Bonneville, mm. um, to basically turn a, a wheelchair into a sort of mobile respirator. Mm. And from then on, he was, he was mobile. And yeah. um, mm. so it's an educational story as well as, as everything else. OK, well, perhaps Mr Graham could tell you the film he went well, to Well, I was see. going to say as well, mm. it's, a, it's a slightly unusual scenario, this, because it's a directorial debut for Andy Serkis, isn't it? Which you would yeah. think wouldn't be quite as, um, I don't mean to say melodramatic, but, I mean, you know, it's quite, a, it's quite an ambitious, ambitious project for your first film. Yes, it is. And, and the, you know, the backstory of it is that his, his partner, his business partner, is a fellow called Jonathan Cavendish. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is the story of his parents. Um, so he was the, he was the, the baby boy conceived oh, before his father got polio. Okay, so he had a huge um, personal interest in it. Yeah, then. yeah, very much so. Yeah, mm. yeah. Wow. Well, that's obviously yeah. why he's been able to imbue it with so much of his mm. own sort of emotion. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Well, it was the direct, you know, it was Andy Serkis, the director who, and a very good script, incidentally, by mm. uh, William Nicholson. Mm. Fantastic script. Right. But, um, so worth I would going to. Defy, even even a man with a heart of stone like you, Mike, I mm. would defy mm. you to. To sit there with that. Well, to be honest, the last time Porky tried to go and watch a movie, he wanted to go and see The Wolf Man of Wall Street, as mm. he called it, mm. uh, but yeah. ended up going to see uh, that other uh, movie about the con job, wasn't it? What yeah, was that's the American right. um, yeah. something or other? It what was, was it? it was, American it, Hustle? Yeah, American Hustler yeah. or something so like he, that. So he actually bought a ticket for one movie and went to see the other cinema. I, I'd been to the <laughs> pub before the uh, show yeah. and I had my bucket of uh, sweets. But old yeah. MG here, he went off last night and he's rubbishing the film we yeah. went to see, but Thor. it was a great action film, Thor. Ragnarok. Well, I mean, it's all right if you like that sort of thing. And obviously, because my kids are like 13 and 10, Mm. they do watch quite a lot of the the Avengers movies and the Marvel comics and the DC comics and all that. But I just, it's almost like parody of itself now, isn't it? Well, it has become, I mean, it's it's very self consciously a. Uh, a parody of the, of the well, it's not exactly a parody. It's just, it's just the, the clowning has sort of taken centre stage yeah. now. You well, know, exactly. The, 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 the comedy used to be a. A bit of an add-on, and now it's the whole. It's all about comedy. Well, that's why I and think actually, I, I don't mind that. Personally. Yeah, I mean, I must yeah. admit, by the time the film finished, I was, I was, I was more interested than I was at the start. And it took me about a good yeah. forty-five minutes to kind of get over the fact that they're all trying to be funny. You just wanted to hit the bar, yeah. did you, and leave your kids there to watch? No, it? I didn't actually. No, no. no, you wouldn't know what it's like to take children to a cinema, yeah. would you? Well, since you, you know, don't have any, well, and you've never had any life well, that you could provide children. Well, with. Hang, hang on, your fatherly uh, credentials are not impeccable. Um, I would Bra- say they're uh, slightly more impeccable. Than yours. Brian, I wanted to ask I you about another. I maintain a discreet silence at this point. But yeah, anyway, uh, uh, exactly. Well, uh, you see now what state he gets into on a Saturday. No, 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 none of that. Um, Brian, I think it's a film you reviewed last week, which is a funny one. I like to go and see things. Is it the death of Stalin? Yes, yes, that's a um, yeah, that's 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 great fun. It's yeah. um, although actually it's not as not as hilarious as I thought it would be. Ah, because uh, it's Armando Iannucci, you know, who, who did the thick of it and and Veep and all those. And um, he's a very funny man, and he wrote a, you know, he's written a very good film. Um, mm. But it's actually, again, it's, it's, it's very educational. It tells the story of what happened when Stalin died in 1953. Mm. And, um, and the Politburo were all jostling for a position to, to be his successor. Sure. And it's the story of that kind of madness. Nobody, none of them knew, you know, which, which of them was going to emerge the most powerful. Yeah. And um, they were all kind of stabbing each other in the back. Mm. Literally as well as metaphorically. And Sounds like um, Fleet Street at its height. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Or even exactly. still now. Yeah, yeah al- almost as bad as that, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Shocking yeah, stuff. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Brian, are you going to be uh, watching Everton this weekend? It's Leicester on Sunday, of yeah. course. Yeah, it's a big one, Mike, isn't it? Yeah, it's a huge I mean, one. You know, it's... it's um, 
but it's uh, yeah, we talk about tragedy comedies, you know, and there's there's one right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was at Chelsea. And... Anything, if you want anything to make you weep, I imagine uh, that'll be one. Well, uh, Chelsea on Wednesday wasn't too bad. I went to Stamford Bridge, and, yeah. and and it was a little better, but we've got a long yeah, way to go. We, we, long we, way to go. I think I think you know they've well, done the right thing, yeah. and I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, hope so. so. Yeah. Hope See, so. This is what it's come to. It's pathetic, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it was a bit better, but we still lost. Well, it doesn't matter because I mean, uh, we don't want to. You don't want to worry about the competitions. We need to move up the Premier League. Brian, as ever, yeah. thank you very much indeed. <laughs> to to well done, Brian. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Brian Viner there, uh, the film critic of the Daily Mail. Coming up next, of course, it is the Porky Quiz. Uh, we've got some pr- trivial pursuit questions mm. for you. And I was incorrect to say I predict four out of ten, mm. because normally speaking, there are six subjects. So it's 12 questions. It is. Uh, I will predict four out of 12. I predict eight. Said. Eight. Eight, really? Yeah, yeah. Have you had a look at the question? Nope. OK. Well, let's get some real news uh, from Victoria Bourne. Uh, anyway, no. now it's time for the Porky Quiz. I'm going to call for uh, the invigilator yep. to bring me the set of questions which have been pre-selected from by, Trivial Pursuit. Uh, by the Trivial Game now, of the Trivial reason, Pursuit. The reason that I had to um, invent... Producer or... Con has just handed them to me. We are, by the way, yep. filming this, so we you'll are, be able yeah, to yeah. watch it later uh, once it's been properly edited. The reason I introduced the uh, Trivial True. Pursuit once a month mm. was because you had such a strong uh, understanding bond should I say corruptly, Incorrect. with the uh, the question masters, right? Uh-huh. Who quiz masters. The quiz masters, yeah. who you try to um, make out are independent, but they in are. fact they're in your back pocket, in- right? Yeah, that's not true. That I decided to take that power away from you at least once a month to, okay. to illustrate to people the real level of my intelligence. Well, here is the Trivial Pursuit box. Yep. I've removed uh, some of the, pay- uh, the cards already, right? Yes. They have not been uh, pre-looked at by me. Yes. As I told you, yes. there are, of course, uh, six categories, categories. Right? You better tell me what they are again. Well, the so. first category is blue. Yeah. So we're going to do it by the colours, right? Right. The second category is... Well, hang on, um, hang on. What's blue subject? I believe blue is geography. Right, geography, OK. Um, the second category is um, a sort of magenta. Yes. OK. What's, I'm and what's think, that? What's and that? I think that's show business. So you only think. Don't you know the... Well, I don't know for sure, no. The yellow category is next. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is you get two questions from each yeah, category. Yeah, exactly, yeah. OK. Uh, the next one is Purple. Purple. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but hang on, what's yellow represent? Well, I don't know. Well, you've got to matter, tell me it? it represents. I can't go into this blindfold. Well, no, you, have, you have two choices, right? You can only yeah. you can only have two. You have two questions from each colour. Yeah, but I have to be about. able to adjust my brain to you know show business, geography, politics. Right. What is it? Well, I think I think literature is num- is purple. Right, literature. yellow looks as though it might be just kind of media or something. Media. Green uh, is, I believe, um, science. Science. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then uh, orange, I think, is sports. Orange sports. Okay. Okay. So right. are you ready? Yes. Um, with your first question, yes. or your first colour. Which colour? Do you wish to choose? Give me the colour blue. The colour blue. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Here's the first question. Mm. Uh, the Trans-Siberian Railway runs from Vladivostok to which other Russian city? Uh, it runs from Vladivostok to... Well, that's obvious, isn't it? It must well, be... So, it... so it's either it's either St. Petersburg mm. or Moscow. Vladivostok, I think it goes to both, actually. So what you're telling me is, where does it end up? Is that what you're asking well, me? Well, it says, which other Russian yeah. city? That's yeah. the question. I don't believe you can interpret it in any different okay. way. Okay, the answer is Moscow. Correct. Thank you. Woo, woo, woo. One nil. Okay. Uh, the next uh, colour, please. The uh, next colour is magenta. Next colour is magenta. Mm. Uh, in which US state is South Park set? South Park. Yeah. South Park. Now, South Park, South Park is, Park a, is, is a, a cartoon, isn't it? It's cartoons. Mm. It's cartoon. And uh, you want to know what state it's set in? Yeah. What, you mean one of 50 American states? That's yes, right. Right. It's in, uh, let me think, let me think, South Park. It's not in New York and it's not in New Jersey. It's not in Washington State and it's not in Florida or Texas. So I think it's in somewhere like, uh, thinking aloud here, I think it's kind of Ohio or something like that, you know. Uh, I can't give you any help. Called? South Park, South yeah. Park, yeah. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, uh, what's one of the best known states? I'm going to say, I'll tell you what. It's probably set in California. A. Incorrect. No. Uh, it is, in fact, Colorado. Colorado. Which colour next, please? Right, next colour, yellow. Yellow. Mm. Um, what did druggist John Pemberton invent for medical purposes in 1886? 1886. Mm. What uh, did uh, druggist, so he's not a druggie, he's, uh, well, he's a he's a pharmacist. He's a pharmacist. Druggist, yeah. And what, he invented something medically. John Pemberton. He? What did he invent for medical purposes in 1886? Okay, well, he didn't invent penicillin because that was uh, Louis Pasteur. Was it? Yeah, and, uh, and so... he invented pasteurised milk. No, what's this guy's name again? John Pemberton. Pemberton. Yeah, I think he invented mm. the the false leg. The false leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
How can he invent a false leg? Because I think he would have done. No, you make a false leg, you can't invent it. Yeah, well, I think he did after the American Civil yeah, well, War. Well, it's not correct. The you answer know? is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola. That's ridiculous. Why is that ridiculous? Because that's not a medical question. Well, I know, he invented I know it things for medical purposes. I don't know much about Coca-Cola. Right, let's get on. All right, let's go next purple. Colour. Purple. Purple. Mm. OK. Uh, Kurt Weill wrote the music for the classic uh, song Mac the Knife. Mac Who the wrote knife. the original German words? Mac the Knife? Yeah. Uh, the original German words? Yeah. What year was this? Uh, it doesn't say. Why can't you tell me? Well, I don't know. So, so It's not written down. I'm not allowed to interfere. Mac the Knife is English, so I don't know why they're writing it in German. But, I mean, if they did, it Maybe would it have been... Some kind of sedition going on. Yeah, it would have been some great German writer, yeah, I probably, would imagine, yeah. OK? How many of them do you know? Uh, no, quite a few of them. <laughs> and so it would be somebody like... Um, uh, thinking aloud now, thinking aloud. Not Engel, it wouldn't have been Engel, I don't think. It could have been Engel, but I'm just thinking aloud. Engel. Right, Engel. Engel. Now, I'll tell you what, uh, I was going to say Engel or Dietzscher. So I'm going to go Dietzscher. for... Dietzscher. I'm going to, I'm going to opt okay. for Engel. Engel. Engel, What's yeah. his first name? It doesn't matter. Uh, you don't he's know his first name, Engel. I can't accept it. Uh, yeah, I know his first name. Well, tell me. Well, hang on, he's, he's known as Engel, <laughs> right? Like, you know, like, um, like Picasso. Like known right, as Picasso. Engel. Yeah, so it's, it's Engel. Okay, it's incorrect. Engel, definitely. Incorrect. No! It's Bertolt Brecht. Everybody knows that. Bertolt from Brecht. From Mac the Knife, yeah. No, I've never, I don't even know what Mac the Knife is. It's a film. By the way, it's Nietzsche is the other name you were Yeah, that's of. the guy I was Not talking Dietzsche. about. Yeah, well, you know. I'd go on. Right, come on, let's get on. Green. Next, uh, next Green. question. Green. Green, These okay. are all dodgy questions so far, by the way. Um, in which geological period do we live? The Jurassic, uh, the Permian, or the Quaternary? Uh, we don't live in Jurassic, because that's mm. Jurassic Park. What's the second one? The second one is the Permian. Permian. And what's the third one? The third one is the uh, Quaternary. Quaternary. I don't think yeah. we've reached the Quaternary yet. I think that happens when the world blows up. So I'm going to say the second one. Permian. Permian, yes. Incorrect. No! <laughs> <laughs> it is, in fact, the uh, Quaternary, uh, which began around 2.6 million years ago. Mm. So we've been in it for a while. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't know that. No, I didn't know. Uh, what do you want to go for next? Well, I'd love to go for orange. Orange? Yeah, I'm going to have a great second round. Oh, OK, let's mm. have a look. Mm. Um, mm. On what ground did England regain the ashes by defeating Australia in the fifth test on August 23rd, 2009? 2009. Yeah. Um, right. Now, was that in Australia or was that in England? I can't give you the answer to that. Mm, it says, on what ground did England regain the ashes by defeating Australia in the fifth test on August 23rd, 2009? OK, I think it was over in Australia, and in which case, the sequence of test matches, it was at the Wacker. Incorrect. No! <laughs> it was at the Oval. The Oval. So it was in this country. Mm, oh Do you want dear. to go back in the same order? Uh, let's go back in the same order. Next one, You've blue. you so far got one out of six. Yeah, I know, but I mean, the questions have been rather obtuse in my view. Really? Mm. I don't think so. Mm. I think you've just had to have a, a, a no. just had to have a, a bit of a problem. Yeah. Of which Canadian province yeah. is Winnipeg the capital? Winnipeg is the capital of uh, now. Think it aloud. I don't think it's Quebec because that's Quebec Quebec City. And uh, I'll also, have to hurry here because we're only we've only got a minute. Was left it Winnipeg? Eh, M- Winnipeg. I just told you, Winnipeg. Yeah. Yeah. Capital of what? Capital of what state? What state? In Canada. In Canada. Yeah. Or uh, province actually. Province, yeah, the province. Yeah. I'd say um, that would be, uh, ooh, let me see, that would be Newfoundland. Incorrect. No. It's Manitoba. It's Manitoba, I was going to say Manitoba. Well, it doesn't matter. I've been to Manitoba, that's well. where the polar bears nearly got me. <laughs> I should have said Manitoba. You should have done, yeah. I nearly did say. Are you going to go for Magenta now? Magenta, uh, yeah. What, what, as what accident-prone English spy did Rowan Atkinson star in 2003? Uh, that would be Johnny English. Correct. Hooray! Oh, wait, I'm amazed wait, wait, you wait, knew wait, that. Wait, I didn't wait, think wait. you would know that at yeah, all. Yeah, of course I do. OK, yeah, so yeah. what's next? Uh, yellow, med- media. OK. In 1975, who mm. was interred in the Basilica of the Holy Cross in the Valley of the Fallen? What? In 1975? In 1975, yeah. who was interred in the Basilica yeah. of the Holy Cross in the Valley of the Fallen? Um, would that be... I think it allowed here. Now, I'm thinking it might be one of the popes, but I don't know why they'd be in the one Valley of the, of the Fallen. Yeah, but, <laughs> you know, because the Pope died around about that time sometime, I think, because yeah. Pope John Paul II came I'll forward. I'll have to hurry you. I think it was the Unknown Soldier. Uh, incorrect. No, it who was, was it? It was Franco. Franco? Yeah. Oh, Franco. Okay. Very well, he died around that. about that time. All yeah. right, Purple next. Yeah. Who wrote Dead Famous and Popcorn? Oh... That's two separate books, by the way. Dead Fames and Popcorn. It's not the name of one book. I reckon it was that uh, very famous, like, Scottish author guy 
who also probably wrote... Oh, well, the guy did Train Spotting. Train Spotting. Ewan McGregor. <laughs> no? Incorrect. That, no? No. No, he didn't write Train Spotting. He was in it. Oh, he's in it, was he? Yeah. I see, yeah, sorry. Who yeah. was it then? It was Ben Elton. Ben Elton. Ben Elton. Ben Elton. He gets around, doesn't he? He ben does Elton. indeed. Yeah. Uh, mm. Question number uh, th- uh, Sorry, Green. Yes, Green. You'll like this one. What device connects multiple computers to both a network and the internet? Um, a device connects yeah. what? Computers to what? Uh, what device connects multiple computers yeah. to both a network and the internet? Well, that would have to be, wouldn't it? Uh, I know you're such an expert on. Uh, as I use them every computers. day. That would be a modem. What? A modem. Incorrect. No, it's not incorrect. Yeah, it's it is a, a router. Modem. No, it's a router. Yeah, well, a router is a modem. No, it's not. It is. It no, is. It's the same it's thing. It's one of the same no, things. No, incorrect. It is. I'm no, telling you. No, it's not. R- last question, right? Yeah. Orange. Which card game has varieties called Omaha and Raz? Omaha and Raz. Yeah. That is undoubtedly uh, Omaha and Raz. Yeah. That would be... Uh, it's a card game, is it? A card game. Card game. Uh, um... Uh, what was that? What's that game in the James Bond films? You know, it's, it says well, thinking loud, answer, thinking loud, furs or something. It's called furs, furs, something like that. But I think this is probably. Uh, I don't know what you're furs. laughing at. It's it's a uh, uh, chauffeur, 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 chemin de fer, chemin de fer. Yeah, no, it's not that. It's not that. Okay, <laughs> so I think it's uh, bridge. Incorrect. No, it's poker, 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 poker. Omaha. So I can tell you that you have got two mm. out of twelve, even yeah. worse, half as bad as I yeah. thought it was going to be, yeah. or twice as bad actually. I think the questions were gerrymandered. I'm pretty certain shocking. the questions were gerrymandered. No, they were. Oh, they, they were. Sure they were. They were from Trivial Pursuit. Mm. That was the Trivial Pursuit Porky Quiz. We are the two mics. We are the two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Talk Radio, we are the two mites coming up after us. Yasmin Khan's going to be here. She'll be along to tell us what's coming up on her show. Uh, don't forget to keep listening to that, of course. Right now, though, uh, we're going to go back to the world of food, yep. which is quite appropriate, actually, because I'm getting a bit peckish. One of the things about doing this particular show mm. from one to four mm. is that you don't mm. eat a lot before you do it. Yeah. It's a bit too early for lunch. Right. And so as a result, by four o'clock, yes. I'm quite ravenous, yeah, to be you're honest. You're always hungry. You've, oh. got, you've got some sort of condition which you should get treated yeah, for. Yeah, it's called normality. You know, no. they say you'll be going to the pub. Anyway, let's talk to one of the great restaurateurs yep. uh, of this country, Mr. Aldo Zilli, yep. is with us. Aldo, a very good afternoon to you. Welcome. Good afternoon, boys. How are you doing? Very, very well, well indeed, Aldo. Very good well to hear indeed. from you. Now, Thank you. Mr. Parry. Still waiting, still waiting to teach you to cook. I know. Oh, well, he keeps bottling yeah. out of it, Aldo, yeah, because he me. knows he's going to make a complete fool of himself. Not but, you me. know, I can't grab it, get him over mm. there, but we'll mm. try and do it soon. Listen, let me ask you this, though. He was saying earlier on Go that on. he's become upset yes. by this um, habit that seems to be forming in North London sort of salons in particular, where people are putting a pig's head on the table Ugh. and calling it dinner. God. Now, I don't know if this has ha- started happening in your restaurants or anything like that, but what do you make of it? Pig's head. Yeah. A pig's head. You, all they're doing now is they're getting a the pig's head, they're roasting the pig's head like you'd roast a joint of beef, OK? They bring it out, they put it on the table, and they say, oh, what would you like, an ear? Oh, would you like a bit of neck? Would you like a bit of cheek? And apparently the ears taste like porky scratchings. I mean, it's the most revolting thing I've ever heard of. Well, it's the tastiest part of the pig, so why waste it? Well, yeah, but it's revolting. I'll they be, put I, the... grew up with, I grew up with stuff like that, and... We uh, over Christmas we used to kill the pig and ate everything of it. But yeah, so but hang on, that, was... but you're eating while a dead pig is staring at you. You know the head of the pig. It's like <laughs> it's like watching it that. Uh, it's like watching that uh, it... TV show the other night when they chopped a bloke's head off. It's awful. Well, it's dead, isn't it? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah no. But see, I my argument, eat, Aldo. My you argument... Eat, you eat black pudding, don't you? Yeah. Yes. But you see, my argument with, 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 with Porky is he's one of these people that likes to think of his, mm. his, his meat and his dinner mm. coming out of a sort of plastic, you know, uh, a sealed Rubbish. container. Rubbish. He doesn't want to think about the actual animal <laughs> itself, whereas I'm a more, much more of a kind of a borough market kind of guy. I like going there, buying some proper beef and some proper You're venison. More refined, don't uh, you? More refined. You? And I yeah. like to buy things that I know have been looked after probably before they've been killed. But he doesn't, you know, you, you, have to, you can't be a hypocrite. If you eat meat, you have to understand it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a bit over the top to put a pig's head on the table. But, yeah. you know, um, I think that uh, it's it's a bit gimmicky, let's put it that way. Yeah, it's, it's I, awful. I, I, would, I, would, um, I wouldn't put it on the middle of the table. I mean, you know, my kids would 
go nuts if I did that. Well, in, well in exactly. My and you say it's the tastiest part of the animal, Aldi. Well, I mean, you know, how, how do you know? Not many people eat it. You wouldn't eat a pig's nose, would you? Yeah, but you people have, have, have hog roasts all the time now. Yeah, well, hog roast is the main meat of the body of the of, of a hog, you know, well, a pig. Yeah, it's not the head, is it? It's no, not the, the head, head, no. But the head's there, though. I mean, I remember being at a hog roast down in Wiltshire and somebody handed me a knife and said, yeah, do you want to cut a bit of the, uh, uh, behind the ear? It's very, very tasty. And you're actually cutting a piece of the, 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 yeah. the meat off the animal. Yeah, it's, I suppose it's better than eating a, a suckling pig, which hasn't even seen any food yet. Right. It's only been drinking mum's milk. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. so, so in Spain and in Italy, you know, suckling yeah. pig is a delicacy. Sure. Yeah. So, but, but where on know, earth would it's, you... It's, it's, it's an animal. So it, yeah. once you... Once you once you have to eat, uh, you know, you kill it, you're going to eat it, you yeah. might as well eat all of it. Yeah, sure. You know, why waste it? But where do these people, you know, in their metropolitan elite uh, mansions Is in North your London... Thing? You're against yeah. the metropolitan yeah. elite. Where, where, where do they get the pig's head from, Aldo? Because, I mean, you wouldn't... Uh, if you were a butcher, you wouldn't flog a, somebody a pig's head, would you? Well, the, the butchers now, they... they um, they're making money on everything. Yeah. You know, the pig's head is going to be... Now that it's on the news... And it's been in the press, and mm. we're talking about it, mm. well, aren't we? We're talking about it. Yeah, but uh, we're talking about it to try and stop it. No, no, we're not. No, I disagree. A revolting practice. No, we 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 plugging it. So it's press, it's it's TV, it's exactly. radio. It's next next mm. week, it'll be on every single menu. You right. Know? Mm. Now and you've got you've got a variety of jumping on the bandwagon. You've got mm. a variety of restaurants, at Al, uh, Aldo, and you've got obviously uh, the fish, uh, the uh, zilly fish. You've got the the veggie place. I wish I had zilly fish. No, it's, uh, I don't have zilly fish. You don't have zilly fish. I, I'm what now a to consultant. It? I'm reopening my own restaurant for next year. Oh, OK, oh, fine. Right. Well, listen, yeah. I love the Zilly Fish, and so if you open one like that, I'll be back, uh, you know, quicker than you can say a pig's head. But, I mean, have you noticed that the sort of vegetarian um, trend, if you like, has affected restaurants in London because you're having to now do more and be a bit more clever with and vegetarian vegan. food? And vegan. Yeah. And vegan. I mean, vegetarian, vegetarian and vegan society is massive. I've written a vegetarian book with, uh, you know, when I uh, fed Mr. Paul McCartney for, for 20 years. Right. Oh, really? My vegetarian, I had a vegetarian restaurant in Dean Street, didn't I? Jilly Green. That's right. right. Is yeah. that gone as well? So, so that's, yeah, yeah, no, all my restaurants are sold. Okay. Uh, we start, we're starting again next year. Okay. Uh, with other people's money, I hope. Mm. Um, and, <laughs> Excellent plan. And, and, yeah, very good plan. And then, uh, you know, um, the Vegetarian Society is probably, uh, they're probably turning, um, you know, they're, they're probably churning around when we talk about big sets on the table. Mm. Uh, but to be fair, you know, we eat, we eat uh, uh, fish heads. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you talk about fish now, uh, I've, you know, you get um, a sea bass, you eat the whole fish and, uh, and then exactly. the cheeks. And you, you get served cheeks, lobster, you, you get the... served whole lobster and stuff and you have to crack it open, you get served crab like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all there. It's all the, yeah. the whole animal. You, you, It's available, and then once you've got it, you might as well eat all of it. Yeah, well, I'm much more traditional than that. You know, at Christmas with the turkey, I just like the old turkey breast sliced nicely into slices, put on my plate, you know, a bit of the old gravy. that suit me. You won't get me eating any uh, any pig's head under any well, circumstances. You need the turkey neck, wouldn't you? Uh, probably not. What no. about feet? <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely not. No, just I mean, give me the breast. It would cost me a lifetime of of, uh, of wasted time mm. to try and actually educate my Trump, parish tr- palate. Remember years ago when you went into an Indian restaurant, you had to pay extra to have chicken breast, didn't you? Because you no, know, they well, used to serve all sorts of uh, garbage. Well, where did you used to go? Uh, well, you know, places in London, you know, really? round Fleet Street well, and all that. Shit. There were chefs, you know, in Michelin star restaurants that, you know, use a couple of breasts from the chicken and the rest the rest goes off, you know, the carcass. Really? They don't use anything else of, the, of really? that bird. Yeah, well, probably so that's, makes a it... wa- that's a waste of time and money, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. it makes well, it listen, Aldo, I know we yeah. say this to you every time we talk to you, but yeah. we must come and sort something out. Have you got a kitchen we can film in, then? Yes. You have? Yes. Good stuff. I'm, I'm ready for you guys. Okay, all right. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, we'll be ready. in touch. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to do something, I'm sure. I, I keep seeing it on Twitter, but it's not good talking about it. We'll I just know. Do it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if, Harry's I mean, the guy. If we did that, mm. if we did that, I'd yeah. get a little suckling pig with the head on. Let's do and, it. Uh, we'll, okay. We'll have a laugh. Let's do that. <laughs> we'll be, we'll be, all right, we'll be well. in touch. I promise you we'll do it. I we promise you will. I'll drag him kicking and screaming mm-hmm. and make him eat some pig's head. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is Aldo Zilli. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Open Aldo. restaurants next year. Uh, we should be guaranteed to go and visit them because he's a marvellous cook. Mm-hmm. Right now, though, uh, it's time to introduce Yasmin Khan, who's here. Aldo Zilli. I'm really impressed. He's a great guy. He's a terrific guy. 
a very nice guy. I didn't even there. know his restaurants had shut down, though. I didn't oh. realise he'd sold them. No, I, used to I go didn't to know Zilli that. <laughs> and Zilly Green. I mean, I don't get out as much as I used to, mm. I suppose. That's the problem. Mm. We're, uh, we're going to take some cooking lessons from, from you as well. Well, you are. Yeah, I am. Yeah, well, you need some as well. I don't need, well. yes, you do. <laughs> I don't need <laughs> cooking lessons. Anyway. But uh, thank you anyway for interrupting. I was just talking yes. to Yasmin there about what's coming up on her show. Yes. He's like that, isn't he? He is. Yeah. How do you solve a problem like Catalonia? I don't know, but we'll find out. We'll talk to someone that does. I don't think you're going to solve it in the next three hours, I have to say. No, but there's a lot, um, I hate to say kicking off, because that sort of undermines it a little bit, but there's mm. a lot going on. There is. Uh, so we'll get the latest on that at, uh, at just after four. We're also going to talk about these hotel booking sites, because I don't know about mm. you, I, d- I do use them. Yeah. Um, they're coming under pressure because um, people are saying that, you know, when you go they're on... misleading. Yeah, and mm. it says, oh, now that you've looked at this room, yeah. 500 other people are looking at it, and sure. you should book it book right it now. now. Yeah. Well, you know, we had a weird thing happen to us. We went to New York the other week for uh, a, a show that we were doing there, mm. and we booked it through Expedia. We stayed in this hotel in Manhattan. Mm. Reasonably priced, not ridiculous. When we checked out, they charged us thirty dollars per head, and there was three of us uh, per night. Facility and they called charge. It a facility charge for booking through Expedia of, on top of what we'd already paid. Yeah. What? Isn't yeah. that ridiculous? No, and you weren't told that up front? No, no. no. I wouldn't I'm, be having, having that. I was not no, happy. Well, it, uh, the problem is when you're waiting there and the car's outside. We were at four o'clock in the morning going to the airport. We just paid it and went. Exactly, yeah. We just got off there. Well, yeah. we're going to be talking about those sites, but also there's a there's a bit of a theme of money through the show today. Um, I talked to a guy who manages the money of billionaires. Uh-huh. Fascinating chat with him about... Um, what they do with their money. And they're all getting richer. They're all, they are all getting richer, how they feel about it. And mm. it's interesting what he said about guilt. Mm. Um, if, you, if you listen, you'll, you'll get to hear that. But I'm also going to talk to a guy who... There has should re- be no guilt in wealth. No, no, well, seen the time, no. by the way. No. Have yeah, you yeah, seen yeah, the time? Don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. We're running out of time. We're here. running out of time. But there's loads. We're also going to be talking about whether or not you should give money to the homeless. There is a guy who thinks that no matter what they're doing, whether mm. they're drinking or smoking or whatever, you should give them money regardless. Okay. I, I give them cigarettes and beer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah you share sandwich. them with them. Mm. Mm. Fantastic mm. stuff. Yasmin, thank you very much indeed. It's all coming up uh, after the news, which is uh, coming up very shortly right here on Talk Radio. Get your hand in your pocket. Get up the bar and get a buys a drink. Talk Radio.